Rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Well, the folks aren't with us at home yet, but I, unfortunately, we have a busy agenda. Uh, as soon as Phil comes in, I will go back and read this little public message so I don't get locked up. And uh, but we're going to get right into it with the voting vote to sell town-owned land. And I believe we're starting with five Audubon Road. Is that correct, Mr. Gilberto? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, could you repeat? Uh, are we starting with five Audubon Road? Yes, that's correct. So we don't have a lot. We have about 20 minutes before we have to go to uh, budget hearing. So I started without the, the video being on. I apologize, but we, we don't have a lot of time. So Certainly. Please. Is, Mr. Chairman, through you, this, so this is a continued hearing um, from roughly uh, four weeks ago. Uh, thank you to the residents who have come back for a second evening. And we, what we've tried to do this evening is to uh, based on the limitation of time, uh, we've identified three parcels that we believe we can get through discussion this evening. There's another three that we're going to recommend be taken up at a continued hearing um, further along, and there's a motion for that continuance later in the packet. Um, with regard to the uh, parcels in question, um, there are two parcel um, uh, at number five boroughs and number eight boroughs that are the first two that we're looking at. And um, the, there's one buyer who's expressed interest in both of those um, uh, parcels previously here this evening. Thank you, Mr. Nikosha, for your time. Um, what we've done is uh, meeting with the Conservation Commission, with the Building Inspector, with the Planning Commissioner, uh, Planning uh, Director. We've identified a series of motions um, that we're recommending the board consider. Can we shut the heat off? I, I just cannot hear yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Certainly. So taking them uh, in, taking them in order. The first parcel, five Audubon, is a motion that recommends the board, if it's so inclined to, um, to sell the property, which would be at auction, to include uh, three restrictions on the parcel numbers one, two, and four. Number one being that it would not be used in and of itself as a separate building lot. Um, number two that. Uh, it would not be used to satisfy minimum zoning or health code requirements for the construction on or use of any building on adjoining land. And number four, that no building or other structure of any kind would be erected or maintained on the pre premises. And um, that's intended to reflect the fact that the parcel um, is, uh, I believe this is the parcel that's adjacent to your home, is that correct? Yes, sir. So it's a small parcel um, on, the, on, the, on the front of the um, corner of Burroughs and, forgive me, your, the cross street. Poplar. Poplar. Um, it's a fairly small parcel that's, uh, that's there. There's also another parcel that's right next to it, I believe, kind of to the northwest that also abuts your property. Yes. But that has not been petitioned for sale of town-owned land, although it may be a candidate for it. And we've talked with the petitioner about the fact that it's another small parcel that uh, he may or may not be interested in that we could <laughs> combine with a sale if that was his, his pleasure. Uh, and that's under the assumption that we would be following the protocols we followed in the past where um, the buyer effectively is just paying our costs for the disposal of the property. So I believe you did have an interest in, in, in that. Um. Come back for that other parcel um, at a future meeting. And if uh, you want, I can step to the uh, podium to try to bring it up on the map to show folks. And if you don't need me to, I won't. Which was this, the 209? We are or are not? Uh, this is the next one. Parcel 209. Right? Oh, okay. This was 193. Yes. But we will be doing 209. And which other one were you referencing? 194? It's on the um, the little thing? Yeah. That little, little. Okay. Right, that yeah, right. Okay. That's correct. I don't know. Is there even a number in there? Yeah, it's 194. I see 194. It's 194. Okay. Yes. I can't okay. see it. So. Wait, no. You want Michael to bring it up on the map? Yeah. Yeah. I thought this was 193. No, the 193 is what we're talking about. It said there's another one that. Which is the little sliver one, or the pointy one? What page is the map on? No, no, in, in thirty-two or one fifty-two. Page thirty-seven. Seven. Yes. Question: Is the minimum bid? Isn't the minimum bid supposed to be the assessed value? Not anymore. No. 
Okay. What about the, the board needs to be in the best interest of the community. We changed the policy a few years back. Okay. Thank, thank goodness. Otherwise, uh, we will retain ownership. And Our goal is to get these back out of the hands of the town and back on the tax rolls, which won't be a lot of taxes, but again, the town doesn't need the property, and the property owners have much more value acquiring it. But if you read the vote on the motion on page 7, you will see there's a lot of restrictions that go with it. So, so I'll just elaborate again. It'll, make, it'll probably make it a lot easier with the map here. So, uh, Mr. Nicola, this is your residence here, I believe? Yes, it is. This is the parcel right here, number 193, that has been requested to be considered for sale. And it is the parcel that we're talking about right now. This other parcel, which is it's shaded, is parcel number 194 on the corner. You can see it's kind of got an irregular shape, kind of a triangle with one side being curved. Um, the reason for the restrictions about the structures on the property is because of the wetland. You can see that it encroaches on on the property that we're talking about in question here to the extent of about two-thirds of it or so. And that was based on feedback from the Conservation Commission. Um, th there's a significant question about its buildability because of that, obviously, and that's where the restriction came from. So, very small. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and is this, is this the street view, Mr. Nicosia, that shows here it's kind of forested? I believe it is, yes. Okay. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah. Uh, I'll have a motion, but in relation to the uh, no building or other structure of any kind shall be erected or maintained on the premises, I've been le leaning away from that sort of thing. If someone wants to put a shed, if someone wants to put a garage on parcels that they're purchasing, and they would be allowed to do so with certain, I mean, conservation comes into play anyway, um, setbacks come into play anyway. This is assuming people would pull a permit. Uh, maybe that's a big assumption, but you know, to me, why wouldn't you let them? Well, we've been using number three, not number four. That's why I didn't understand why it was highlighted. It really highlighted number three should have been, right? Isn't that what we used in the past? And I was going to ask that, too. Yeah, in other words, right. I'd want them to conjoin everything, and if they can yep. build a shed, build a shed. If they can build a garage, build a, you know, some ancillary structure. I'm not talking about a new home, but... Uh, it, well, they probably put that in and recommending it because of the wooded marsh. I know, but they wouldn't so be allowed. To, and again, it may not be allowed to do it anyway, you know, under the zoning bylaws and conservation and all the rest. So why would we put a restriction on right. it? Read number That's three. It's not necessary. But number three, we've been using a, an awful lot. We've been using that. Yeah, but you'd have to add additional language that's provided that it would be permissible under, but, you know. But number three, we've been, uh, number we've been three requiring says people to to make it part of their main parcel, make it one parcel instead of two or three separate ones. So in other words, make it one big parcel and then then it's all subject to the local zoning and conservation right. rules anyway. And if they want to build a garage and they're able to do so, let them do it. They want to put a shed, let them do it. You know, otherwise, what's the purpose of buying it other than you're looking for a buffer and privacy? Right. Uh, That's what they said they would do. No, I know. but. To me. But then you'd have to add that language that provided that it's in compliance with all. No, yeah. because it would have to be anyway. It would have to do. It, it would have to be anyway. Part of the process. It would have to be anyway. You know, so we, I think three is more applicable. Is, is more functional. When we go, and again, it would require them to join it with their other parcel, so that you're not going to have three little parcels on it. You're going to have one parcel. One single owner, and when it gets transferred at a later date, it's one parcel, one single owner, and it's subject to all the local zoning and setbacks and all the rest. And right now, there's no requirement that they um, join it with their other parcel, and it would have to be looked at separately. And yeah, nothing could be done with it if we just sell it that way and they keep it that way. Uh, again, there's nothing preventing them from removing the boundary lines, but it wouldn't be required. Yep. And again, I don't want to unduly restrict people if normally they would be able to do it. You know, once they make it part of their, their original parcel, make it one big parcel and do with it what you can, as opposed to continuing to piecemeal it. I mean, the last sentence of that, number three, is important. It's not there to create a new or additional building lot. It's allow them to build off their existing 
structures. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I would not be in favor of shifting it unless there was that added language or that added caveat. I don't care if it's understood or agreed or it should be in there. If we're going to shift to it, we should be stating that. Whether they have to do it or not or, or what have you, I wouldn't be in agreement. I would we, vote against it unless we added that we language. Have had, uh, we've had council look at this yeah. in past years in relation to the, our options and had uh, discussions at yeah. length in relation to, you know, what would applicants be subjected to um, if they could join the lots, make one lot, and it basically they're subjected to it anyway, all the local zoning bylaws and all the rest. So it, it's kind of redundant and unnecessary. You can vote against, that's fine. But we have had council look at this, and it, number three protects us, and allows, and, it, and they have to follow the process. This doesn't, re Number three again, if, we're gonna, if we're going to be selling, you know, this parcel and the one behind it, um, and for some reason they want to put a shed out back, go for it. You know, why not? Yeah, we usually do one, two, and three, right? One, two, three, and I believe, I thought six. Too. We don't do, I don't remember doing four last year. We don't do four. Yeah, yeah six should be highlighted, too. Well, I, I think I think four is being recommended because of the conservation recommendation right. that you know it's too close to the conservation land. Well, if it's too close to the conservation land, it's too close to the conservation land anyway. Right. Then, then that's why if we're switching to three, we should say that. No. <laughs> because we've been given this by council and whoever but, else reviewed yeah, it for Kate, us. Not to, not to be argumentative here, but if they're going to go ahead and integrate this into their existing lot and then want to build a shed in the area. They still have to submit their plans, and they have to build outside of the wetland area. They're not going to be allowed to do it when they submit their plans. This doesn't give them approval to build within the wetlands. No, this way here, if you go with 3K, this would require them, if they're going to put another building, a structure on it, they would have to. They would have to combine it with the adjoining lot. Yeah. No, if they don't, they can't. Of course. Right. So, so it's a little so redundant the, to add six, but that's fine, too. Because the same party wants to acquire both portions of I know. that. So basically what, what I'm suggesting or saying is that three has been most useful for some people uh, where if they do have an intent either now or in the future to put an additional structure, it's not a new home, it's, you know, it's a shed or something like that, they would have to combine it with the adjoining lot and then it's all subject to the regular local zoning and conservation restrictions anyway. Okay. I agree, but Other, otherwise, not otherwise bid on it. this does not allow them. They might them. be outbid for this in the other lot, and someone might be wanting to. No, no, but, but the. They're uh, still going to go by our zoning laws, though. Right. If somebody else bids for it and gets it, they're still not going to be able to build a yeah. house on that lot. Right. This restricts it. So, the, the, well, get it, it, it allows it. whoever the successful yeah. bidder is, it allows them to the opportunity to join it with the existing parcel that they own and then apply for a permit. When they apply for the permit, it's subject to the local zoning and conservation. You, you vote any way you feel comfortable, yeah. but I, I, I personally don't think it's necessary there. to make any modification, and I'm not sure you have the support of anyone else to make a modification, because um, I think it's already modified. It meets what you're looking for. So I, I hate to press everyone, but we are a little bit under a time crunch. So if there's no other questions this on this. This will probably help with the, well, again, um, so. I'm going to make the motion. I'm going to I'm going to be recommending one, two, and three, even though what's highlighted in front of us is one, two, and four. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I move to sell by auction town-owned land designated as Map Eight Parcel One Nine Three, located at Five Audubon Road, in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter Sixty, Section Seventy Seven B, at a minimum bid price of six hundred dollars, by it to pay all fees, costs, and expenses associated with the conveyance, subject to the following restrictions. One, not be used in and of itself as a separate building lot. Two, the premises shall not be used to satisfy minimum zoning or health code requirements for the construction on or use of any building on adjoining land. Hmm. Uh, three, no building or other structure of any kind shall be erected or maintained on the premises unless the premises is combined with the adjoining, with the adjoining and premises not Second. No. We have a motion and a second by Mr. Secretary. Any discussion, Mr. Schultz? Uh, do we normally do six? That's just. 
I thought we did. Yeah, I thought we did too, but I don't. I, I think the feeling was it wasn't applicable, but I see no harm in doing it if you want. And the property should, property should not be subdivided. Second. It's the reason why it's not is because you put three instead of four. No, so because the reason it was there. It's redundant, just like my uh, request uh, no. to add language. I'm going to explain to you. Any Mrs. kind of structures being built must comply with the law. That's redundant too, but. The reason it's there, number six is there, is because you know, once this, these two parcels get integrated into this existing lot, if they decided to sell the entire lot with the other combining lots, their neighboring lots, they end up selling to their neighbors to, ex to create a new subdivision, they won't be able to do it with number six being part That's what three says, not used to create new or additional building but lots. No, but the, but no, but they six sell doesn't it. allow it's them. To, no, no, it doesn't allow them to cut it in half and sell it to the correct to the neighbor. That's it's that's redundant. later on. Just like my recommendation okay. that we include that if there is any kind of structure, it must be in compliance with all of our. So, colleagues, it's one, two, three, and six is what, uh, well, what the motion is. Second that motion. Yeah, second by Mr. Schultz. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed? No, I, I'm in favor of it. Okay. <laughs> I think that language should be added, but I'm So unanimous. Okay. Now, we had a few more. We'll get next lot. The next lot is number eight. It's actually directly across um, the street, uh, uh, which is Audubon's uh, Road. You can see I've highlighted it in blue. Again, another lot with a substantial amount of wetland on it. It does have um, frontage on Audubon Road, and it kind of comes to an apex over here on Burroughs Road. Um, I don't want to speak for the petitioner, but this parcel here, number 195, is also town-owned. We've had some discussion about whether you may be interested in that parcel or not, only um, because of the fact, I, I think, at least Karen, I think. I thought it was number 194. I don't know that 195 was ever brought up. So uh, we're on to the next one from your original request, okay. at number eight, the, the one across the street. I understand. So you had asked for number five, which the board just voted on, and it's yes. over here in green, and now we're looking at number eight. And I'm only highlighting that in addition to, sorry, this is a kind of slow to update. 195. In addition to the lot across the street, which is now not highlighted for me, um, the town actually owns this lot, and it may be in a similar situation as this other lot, mm -hmm. which he may petition at in the future. Um, with regard to number eight, it is a larger lot. Um, I, I, we didn't get too far into whether it's subdividable or not, but I believe that it probably is. Whether it's buildable or not is another question because of the wetlands. Uh, there may be a trespass issue going on here in the northeast side of the, par of the parcel from one or more of these lots. I don't think it shows up here, but I believe there is a house it on this some. lot, number 196. Uh, no, yes, there's, there's you have to come to, I'm sorry, you have to go to the podium, I apologize. Just state your name and uh, address and then because the folks at home can't hear you without that microphone. Hi, Ed Nicosia, number two, Poplar Terrace. Um, with regards to 196, there is no, there is a shed, it looks like a storage shed or a tool shed, it's not a dwelling that's there and they appear to be abandoned. I went and looked and they're in, in terrible repair. So I don't know that the encroachment that's there now was, is not from an existing uh, homeowner in the neighborhood, it's from someone who used to live there and has abandoned those items. So, right? As far as I know, there's no, Dwellings on it. There's two of them, though. The, 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 I see two sheds. There's two, and they're adjacent, almost immediately adjacent to each other. In the aerial photo, it looks as if there's one, but it's actually two, and they're both in terrible. Mr. Gilbert. And to clarify, I believe you don't object to acquiring the property, even though it has the, the structures on it. Right. I, I guess I do have a question about um, do they have some possession of that or use of that property uh, in perpetuity based on. If I was to buy it or successfully bid and buy it, it's a good it question. Come with their right of use of that. I don't understand they have right of use of the town land. They're just encroaching. So I mean, we we haven't conducted a title. Um, that's a hostile, that's a hostile, hostile possession question. Adverse no. uh, no. twenty minutes. And, and, uh, adverse possession. Yeah, excuse me. And I'm not sure whether I don't know how long the shed's been there. Has it right. been there voluntarily? Is it been permitted? So I, I don't know that we could warranty that either way. I okay. think is probably the. And your intent on this one here now, Audubon Rose does come up and over. It doesn't, it, 
In theory, it's yes, but it's impractical to go past this is uh, what, what's what identified as uh, lot 177 or 191. The topography there is just too steep. There's no way, maybe with some kind of off-road vehicle or something you could get through there, but with the overgrowth and other things, it, the, it's just much, much too steep. It's treacherous even to walk through there. Although there is a little bit of flat land up next, adjacent to 208. But Audubon, I guess on paper here, extends through, but in reality it does not. Okay. So that would lead me to the question of, when you talk about the abutter being able to join it to their property, where Audubon is, is dividing the two properties, 174 and now 208, are they able to combine them across this road? So Mike, that see the blue line to the mm -hmm. right of the blue line between 174, this, this little, that little space. The road. So does that come with it or is this going to be something, we're going to combine it with 174 and have a... So uh, we have a, a road in the middle. So it looks like there is a, a paper street type layout that's there. Um, this parcel would uh, would own to the center line of that paper street if that in fact is the case. And I have not researched the title to confirm that or not. Um, so y you would be talking about um, you know rights no different than would be on any other unaccepted road. The ability to combine those lots across the paper street uh, that I, I I couldn't I couldn't tell you. Because you're ta then you're talking line. about it. You, you're, you're basically you you're owned to the center line, but I, I don't know that you could, for example, put a structure in the street. Um, the, I'm not sure that you you would have that right. That you have to talk to an attorney about it. To be honest with you, I couldn't advise you. Well, I think How far does the road go there? How far down does the road go? It goes all the way to Burroughs, and then in the other direction, you can see where it intersects with Lakeside. Lakeside Boulevard. It, but in that, from I think from that where the cursor is down to yeah. the southwest is all paper street. That, I think it's that's wooded. right. It stops right right about here mm -hmm. at the corner of that house. It's just a little bit of space there, and then it becomes quite steep. It's very down steep. Into so 190 uses the road and above there. Yes. As you look at this map. They go this direction to Lakeside Boulevard. Any other I'm questions? Like if not, I'll take a motion. But, but just, my, my only concern is in relation to the motion we make is, you know, I, mean, I don't know if you would have an objection, including three again, where, you know, you can't put a structure on it unless it's combined with the other one. You know, I don't, I don't know if your intention is to put a shed out there or not at some uh, point. I'd like to utilize some of the flat space um, on this side for a shed. Of course, not on the road. Um, but no, I have no objection. It would be combined. Our intent is to combine with 174 and hopefully 193. Uh, so then we would like to be able to join the two and then erect a, a tool shed, a storage shed or something. But no, not another dwell. Mr. So just to be clear, I, I can't represent that you'll be able to do that because of the I was going to say. You, you'd have to really look into that. Oh, you can't. Okay. Yeah. The, Subject all. The only, yeah, you can't combine. There's nothing to combine because there's a street that separates well, the two lots. It's a, it is a paper street, and the owner's own to the middle of the road. And there are other areas all over this particular section of town where it's uh, I think that's been the case with the owner both sides of the street. Should we hold off on this and get a little more guidance? Okay. Yes. So I, I would, to, to me, I think that the risk is probably more on the on the buyer, and it would be. I'm more concerned about the person that's using town-owned property for some use. Mm -hmm. I'm more concerned about selling this property to a new owner and then have, leaving that problem out there. I, I think that should be addressed before we sell this. I think we have a responsibility okay. personally. So, Andy, what's a, you, I don't know if you've dealt with an adverse possession or not in the past. Well, like he says, town on land. I mean, that's. I have. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I have, too. Okay. although, you know, I have, you can't adversely possess town land. There's competing case law on it, but for the most part, you can't adversely possess something that is the town spell, Okay, good. And second of all, you need to be cautious of this if it's an access road or did you just say that people are accessing their parcels on the paper street? No, they are not. It stops okay. here at, at, at where it says 191, that corner. The road, the actual dirt road stops in about here somewhere. Okay, so the topography, so Kate, is like this. Yes, yeah. Yeah, because you don't also <laughs> don't want to take away. Right, when well, you're coming over from the lakeside, it goes. Take something away, because right, right now we own to the middle, too. 
just like the opposite side ones to the middle. Yeah, we don't have the, the sheds that are there are in terrible the repair, dilapidated, <laughs> ready to collapse. There's, there's no one maintaining them. I don't think anybody has it. Do we, Mr. McCullough, do you know how long that shed's been there? Eight years. Do we know who the owner is? More than 20? Sheds? Probably on or about. I, I couldn't say. They look like they've been rotting. This is Minya Pelly. Yes. What do you suggest we do? Bearing in mind that we're putting this out to auction, we're tailoring it to this gentleman, but 208 might bid on it and outbid this 196, gentleman. So same thing. Exactly, yep. exactly. Anyone really could come in and outbid. Again, I just want, my concern is that we put this out for bid and there's an issue. I think we should address the issue before we put out the bid. That's all. We shouldn't leave it up to the new property owners to deal with this. It's not right. And it's our problem. We should deal with it. And the Taper Street is a concern. So. And that's good. He's going to have to work with a lawyer on that. But I think, Kate, if you were counseling us with the... Which I'm not. I'm I not know, you're not. Lawyer, I'm just so. saying, your, your professional advice, we, we have a prop piece of structure on town-owned property. How do we address it? Should we go to the person that put it there, the owner of 196? Well, the buyer's going to do a title exam. I mean, it's up to the buyer to examine the title. But who would even know who put it there if it's dilapidated Yes, like sir. That? The, the so. former owners at number 190 erected those sheds and have long since moved away. So they've been abandoned. Who owns 196? Because I think they're on both. I think they're on 196 he, he, and... Actually, this recently transferred to... Uh, I understand Mr. John Maxey. So my understanding, though, is the shed's on both of the properties, on ours and in 196, isn't it? Uh, I don't think so. Think okay. All right. Yeah, but I'm not the yeah. lawyer for the board, so. Then so we'll have to take them down. Or we sell them as is with the right. structures. Well, either way, you know, if, if, if the property owners of 208 and 196 um, wish to bid on this and purchase it, you know, it should be conjoined with their joining parcels anyway. You know, okay. Uh, Mr. Nicosia wants to uh, deal with the issue, you know, going forward if he ha happens to be the successful bidder. Uh, with the paper street, you know, that'll have to be resolved yeah. between he, his attorney, and the courts, I suppose. Uh, but if he's willing to assume that risk, that's okay. But whoever acquires this lot can tear their sheds down that on their own. Yeah, I would assume so. They should, and again, based well, upon what you're saying, no one's really saying using that. it. I think no they should consult that. their counsel and decide what's best for them. It doesn't yeah. sound like they'll be in use anyway. Yeah. So. All right. So, so that's so. so Okay, so we want the same restrictions then? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Chairman, I move to sell by auction town owned land designated as Map 8, parcel 209, located at 8 Audubon Road in accordance with chap uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 60, Section 77B, at a minimum bid price of $600, buyer to pay all fees, costs, and expenses associated with the conveyance subject to the following restrictions. One, not be used in and of itself as a separate building lot. Two, premises shall not be used to satisfy minimum zoning or health code requirements for the construction on or use of any building on adjoining land. Uh, three, no building or other structure of any kind shall be erected or maintained on the premises unless the premises is combined with adjoining, uh, it should be adjoining lot, and premises not used to create new or additional building lot, and property shall not be subdivided. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Yes. Did you identify a price? It's in the, he wrote it. Seven, $600, I believe, right? $600 plus the cost, Minimal. plus the cost of conveyance. Plus, right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we are going to skip through down the agenda and go right to the budget hearings. That's supposed to start at 730. But before we do, yes, sir. One more parcel. One more parcel. I just don't think we can do it. It shouldn't take long, right? I say 144. Okay, we better call in. Uh, call in for breakfast then. <laughs> if you want to do it, we have a hearing at 7:30. Yeah, right. Get it done. All right. 144. This is Burroughs Road. Mr. Gilboro. Mr. Chairman, through you, we had a request from the property owner here at number 92 Burroughs Road, Mr. and Mrs. Bonaventura, for you this evening. They're looking to purchase this parcel that's in green here. Um, it's a uh, what, what appears to be a very wet piece of town owned land. Um, I believe Mr. Bonaventura is interested in purchasing only a small portion of it. 
we consulted with the conservation agency based on uh, what that's on it, uh, the recommendation of the town not sell the property. Uh, currently, there is some usage that uh, we'll, I guess we'll say stra straddling the, the line between the private owned property and the town property. Um, that Mr. Bond is maintaining it. If the board were to elect to move forward with selling it, despite the Conservation Commission's recommendation, the options would be to sell it as a whole parcel or to have it uh, subdivided uh, to what I assume would be in this will not require a plan. Presumably, the petitioner would need to pay for that. The challenge with that, of course, is that they would be petitioning yes. for an AR for land that they didn't own and might own after an auction. So it becomes a bit challenging for the boss. Again, with the backdrop of it is a weapon that's being recommended by the conservation commission not to be sold. Not to sell it. Okay. Any board member interested in going against what the conservation is recommending? Again, I apologize. I wasn't at the, the last meeting. I assume there was some sort of a uh, discussion in relation to what well, we didn't have an input it. from conservation, I think, on this problem. No, but uh, again, the owner, again, I didn't have uh, the ability to, to hear what they were looking to do. Oh. So uh, the property owners here, are they welcome to come up? If you could maybe express to us what your interest <coughs> is in that parcel. Just state your name and your address for, for the record, please. Fernando Bonaventura, 92 Barrows Road. Um, We've been living in the property for 32 years, and we've been, um, since we bought the property, there's a section of land about 30 feet by 100 feet that the previous owner, if you can make it, yeah, that the previous owner had uh, been using, and keep going a little more. Uh, so the property, that's not quite right, but the house on the right is, is our house there, and the blue line is almost where the property line is. And so there's only about 30 feet of dry land before it becomes wetland. And so uh, what I would be interested in doing is, is, since I've been maintaining it, cutting trees on it, to the Board of Health and the Conservation Committee, I have a paperwork here that shows that I went there saying we got trees that had damage on our property, that were going to damage my property. And they said, well, if you pay to take care of it, uh, you can do it. So I have letters here for that. So I would be interested in really about 30 feet by about 100 feet, <coughs> which is land that we've been mowing and maintaining and cutting trees on and so forth and so on that would uh, add value to the property instead of the full six acres. And what we'd be willing to do would be to go through the process of partitioning it and paying the, uh, the folks to come in and survey it and whatever the town wants to sell it for. Larry. So to, to the town administrator, if that's what they're offering, what do we have to do to try and accommodate that? In order for the town to sell a portion, for the board to sell a portion of the property, we would need to go through an approval not required process to draw a new lot line, create a new lot on it. Um, that's not something that we've customarily done through this process and we customarily have past any of the expenses for such a drawing uh, or, or a transaction aligned to the buyer. Uh, and I, I, don't, I don't know what that cost would be at this point in time. You'd need to do a wetland delineation, I would assume, because of the wetlands that are there. But that, that would be your option if you were to choose to do that. Yes. Is 142 your lot as well? No. That line, that property line is not drawn correctly. Okay. <coughs> So your house is pretty close to each other? Yes. Okay. Yeah, about eight feet apart. Okay. And the property line runs down the middle. That shed is theirs. So where the blue and the green meet? Right there? Yeah, that okay. one is yes, correct. It's it's my neighbor's shed. It's so you're there. looking at the dry line that kinda of hooks around in there. Right. Okay. Yes. Sort of where that blue sort of exactly how that triangle is drawn not to take all of the, the conservation land, but just that, that piece that is about 30 feet that doesn't flood. Well, it does flood. So, <laughs> what, so we'd have to take a different motion and a different action than what's being proposed. Well, we would have to direct the administration to, to start taking some action to potentially do the A&R. 
to provide the opportunity to then sell it off <laughs> rather than selling the whole parcel. And again, if we can retain the, you know, five you know, half acres of in conservation, all the better. Yeah, you yeah. would retain all six. I mean, it's only 300 square feet that I'm asking for. Sure. I'm fine with it. Yeah, I mean, we need the engineering first. I mean, I don't. You've got in-house staff to, to do some of it anyway. To, if it's the majority of the board's wishes to to accommodate. Absolutely. Okay, board so members, you're okay with that? Yeah, I just think uh, I think you would need to have a surveyor. Yes. Come up we with a plan would, that you, what you propose right. you want. We exactly. We would get a surveyor and do a, pay all the expenses and then whatever the town wants to value they want to put on it. I believe is a process, right? Okay. So, to the town administrator, I think the majority of the board is okay with looking at his request and then uh, see what we can need, need to do to bring it to fruition, I guess. I, we, it's a lot easier for us to review something that's been drawn up rather than to contract to draw something because we don't have an appropriation right. to cover that. At right. this point in time. All right. So, so if you want to go and, and make a proposal, yeah, I, I think maybe we could talk with the conservation commission about what yeah. might be how to draw the line. Let me know the next steps. Okay. We'll contact you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. So we're gonna pass that over. We're gonna pass that up. Yes. I apologize to everyone. So, in, uh, Mr. About 15 minutes behind. So, Mr. Chairman, are we going to uh, move to continue the hearing? Yes. Okay, Please. Mr. Chairman, I move to continue the hearing uh, to Monday, April 1st at 6.15 p.m. 6.15? So, <laughs> based on the current schedule for budget hearings, we really have no choice but to go a bit earlier okay. that evening if yeah. the board As is you can see, able to accommodate. We have two pages tonight, and we're, not, we're going to be here a while. Correct. We have a lot ahead of us. So, again, Mr. Chairman, I move to continue the hearing to Monday, April 1st, 2019 at 6.15 p.m. Second. A motion is second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Before we get started with the budget hearing, I just I need to read this real quick. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. I do apologize to the folks listening at home that we had a little technical difficulty getting started right on time. So, uh, but Phil seems to have got it all worked out. We're rocking and rolling. We're going to go right into the budget hearings. And then we're going to come back and reconvene following the agenda as printed. Mr. Gilberto, who is starting with the human resources. That's correct. That's the first budget hearing scheduled for this evening. And the director, Mr. Collins, is here for a presentation. Can we get a microphone over to him? Is that possible? Phil, is it okay if I move that? Or you can move that yeah, mic? I get it. Or, you know what? Yes, because Finn Tom. Well, why don't we move that one for the finance committee? We'll take this one. That's okay. Bob, could I ask you to maybe just slide down here? Yeah, no, I'm fine. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind, just slide down. Abby loves that microphone. Okay, Mr. Gilberto. Sorry. Um, just a friendly reminder, uh, as I've been stating at the beginning of each of the budget hearings, the budget process so far this year has included the board and the finance committee reviewing the requests of the various departments. Um, I have not made a recommendation uh, relative to any departmental request, and that is the case with the budgets that are before you this evening. It's our intention, the finance director and I, to offer recommendations at the um, board's meeting of April 22nd. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for having me here this evening. Um, we have a very modest budget increase of $100 over last year. It came to my attention recently that uh, the benefits coordinator, Olson, Olson, was paying for the water in our department out of her own pocket, and I think that that should not continue. Um, other than that, everything else is level funded. Uh, over the course of the last year, we've been involved, and in basically our job is a, a typical HR department. Our clients are the employees, uh, the department head, the town administrator, and, and the board itself. 
Um, we also uh, administer benefits, and we've been working very closely with IBG as well as uh, RSI, uh, IBG being the town's insurance broker and RSI being a third-party administrator. Um, as discussed earlier, uh, we have a very, very favorable increase in uh, health insurance uh, that is significantly below budget. Uh, during the course of the last calendar year, we were involved in the hiring of 43 employees. Uh, and again, some of those would be seasonal or part-time in, in replacing it. We're in the process of uh, utilizing an assessment center to uh, get to a permanent uh, full-time civil service fire chief. We are in negotiation with a, a number of the collective bargaining units, uh, one of which includes uh, civilization of dispatch, uh, which would be a force redeployment in the police department, uh, getting more officers out in the streets. Uh, that's the short version. I know that you're pressed for time. I can certainly answer all any and all questions. As we go into uh, 2020, uh, we're looking to uh, continue to fill uh, vacancies with qualified applicants. Um, the increase in terms of uh, the board's permission to uh, allow certain positions to be designated as special municipals has helped with that. And I think we've struck a very good balance with the yearly review. This keeps the department sharp, it keeps us sharp, and, and keeps the board with having the overview to make sure that this isn't something that isn't looked at on an annual basis. Uh, we're going to continue to work with uh, IBG and RSI to find even more innovative ways to uh, increase employee engagement. Uh, I will say that the employees, both on the municipal side and the school side, have done a tremendous job in terms of stepping up and realizing the impact, uh, not only in the town's budget, but their own pocketbooks, uh, as to how they treat insurance. And that has been reflected, I believe, in the, the low increase. Um, we are uh, continuing on with the employee recognition. We have an annual event that has proven to be successful year over year. It has increased. Uh, we've done the golden ticket, uh, which is a new way of uh, having folks recognize each other. Uh, traditionally, in most organizations, it's top-down only. This allows for lateral and bottom-up appreciation interdepartmentally from uh, other departments recognizing and then also realizing that the mission uh, which is to serve the public, is not accomplished in a singular silo fashion, but by cooperation amongst the various departments. Uh, for the coming year, we're also going to look at the possibility of an opt-out provision uh, for folks that uh, have the opportunity to take their health insurance elsewhere. Uh, it would have to be done instruction in a fashion that would uh, result in both savings for the town and an incentive for the employees. So, had some experience with that in the past, and it's, it's proven uh, fairly successful. Um, and again, that would be something that we would uh, work closely with our insurance brokers to make sure that it was done in a sustainable manner. Any questions for Mr. Collins? Mr. Smith. When, you ha when there are employment positions available, how can members of the public find them? On your particular department website? Yes, that's an excellent question. What we did is uh, we actually, uh, two years ago, decreased our advertising budget, uh, but also then strengthened the uh, controls. So what we do now is, uh, at a minimum, for those who don't have computer access, there's a, a new bulletin board that's been erected about a year ago down the corridor by the HR department. All jobs are posted there, plus all jobs are also uh, located on the HR portion of the town's website. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, uh, if a department, once they've established those at minimum two points of contact, wants to uh, do further advertisement in a professional journal or in a newspaper or, or some other media, they're certainly welcome to do so. But these are the most important and critical uh, points of contact to make sure that it's fair and that all of the jobs are in those two spots. Mrs. Minnie-Belly? Just one more thing. I just wanted to thank you, too, for your service. That You do an amazing, tremendous amount of work, a lot of behind-the-scenes work that people don't realize human resources in, is involved in, and you do it quite well. And I, I love the uh, employee appreciation initiatives that you you've rolled out, especially the, you said the golden ticket, the yellow page. Yes. Because we also have a bunch of amazing employees here, so it's great to acknowledge them on a consistent basis. So I hope that's up and running and used well, too. So I just wanted to say thank you for the work that you do, because it, it is real, really value-added work. 
Thank you very much. I, it, it's a team effort, and uh, I have to say that I'm very impressed with uh, the attitude that the employees have towards that. Um, uh, you know, I've been doing this for a while now, and I've done it in public sector as well as private sector, and they're truly a dedicated group of employees here that uh, have the public's interest at heart. Anybody else have a question for HR department? Just a real quick comment, I know we're busy. I just want to say the level of professionalism from your office is exceptional. Just dealing with you guys, and you guys do a very, I, I think you do a great job for town hall and for the community as a whole. I just want to say that on the record. Thank you very much. I myself, you know, being in the chair of the board, I have to work with you a little bit more. And I have to say it's been, uh, you made my life a lot easier. You really have. I'm not very good with the technology stuff and certainly the writing piece of my responsibilities and you've helped me out tremendously with so I thank you and I, I look forward to seeing what you do next in the next uh, several years as you continue to keep growing and but e human resources has been something that we've needed more of for many years around here you certainly are your whole approach both you and Allison has been refreshing from at least a non-employee perspective I'm not sure all the other employees will see see it they may see it differently but for me where I sit I, I see a big difference and, and it's certainly been appreciated by all thank you so if there's no other questions we'll cut mr. Collins loose and we'll get right into the park and rec where we will uh, spend the next hour and a half I assume <laughs> based on tradition <laughs> oh you're giving money back so this is oh, my <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> You're that's the ones with budget, even budgets even reduced. Yeah. Pretty simple. Yeah. That's even easier. Hour and a half. Um, what page? Yeah, do you have Sorry. Let me get that for you. It's 318 it's, uh, in the Dropbox. 286. 286. Gotcha, 318. <laughs> Dropbox, we don't use that anymore. <laughs> Good evening, Parks and Rec folks. I'm Maureen Stevens. I'm the Operations Director, Department Head of the Parks and Recreation Department, and I'm here to present the budget. And um, before I do that, I have a shameless plug, if I can find it. Um, let's see if I can get to it. Um, it's our wine and food social, and it's uh, this Friday, uh, March 22nd, from 7 to 10 at the Hillview Country Club. Tickets are $45. Um, I have a slide at the end, and I'll, I'll show you that. Um, and it's our biggest one-day fundraiser uh, of the year, so we're doing very well selling tickets, and we hope to see people there. And if you want to get tickets, they are online, uh, easily accessible. So just wanted to throw that out there as my shameless plug, but it is a, a very good part, um, fundraiser for the year. It's one of our biggest, and we have a lot of fun. So here's our budget. This is who we are. We're the operations park structure. These are all our permanent full-time employees. We have uh, 102 years of department experience between all of us. So we're in, uh, we age each year, so next year it'll be more. Um, there's all of our programs that we do for recreation. Um, we have 2,700 plus member accounts. And in, in that, that means household accounts. And in that, we have 6,158 members that we deal with. Um, and we've dealt, we did 4,213 registrations last year. We had uh, 3,800 in residence, 383, so about 10% non-residence. Uh, we did 265 program activities from zero to 99. We do morning, afternoon, evening. Most popular program, summer program, summerscape. Uh, worth mentioning, it's 7.30 to 5.30. It's uh, our crowning, uh, our crowning established uh, program for the summer. It's uh, well-renowned and um, well worth sending your ch children to. So we have 21 science and sports clinics, trips all over the place, and um, discount tickets. So there was some escape last year. Um, There's a great picture of uh, the group of the kids at the batch. Um, it's a Trevor Park running peewee soccer, They're very popular. Um, we had flashlight candy hunt and a flashlight candy cane hunt. Over 100 participants at each. Um, one was at Ipswich River Park, one was here at the Town Hall. Um, we have programs at the Rec Center, that's our Rec Center walls that uh, the kids and uh, the Recreation Director painted. Um, we get into the Parks and Fields Maintenance, 
We did about 6,300 hours of scheduling, 288 permits issued. We mowed 93 acres. Special projects that we did, we had the opening of the turf field concession bathroom facility. We did some access paving at the turf field that wasn't within the budget that uh, the Friends of uh, paid for. And uh, for the spring, which will be uh, mid-April, paving at the rec center and the walkways paving its capital. We have a part capital for FY19, part capital 2020. Uh, between the two of those, those are going to be done in the summer months. So we can wait, uh, can't wait to get those done. So we have Benevento, Little League Fields, Chestnut Street, Soccer Fields, um, Clark Park. Um, we were just talking probably about that in that great area of Barrows Road. Ipswich River Park, um, beautiful park, five stars, rated great park, it's a five star park. It's got everything you could think of um, on it, in it, um, and we take care of all of it. And there it is, uh, there's our drone shot of it and um, it's quite beautiful. Can't wait for it to be that green. Uh, there's Mullen Park, uh, Marlin Field. We have flag football, ultimate frisbee, field hockey, baseball practices. It's another multi-purpose, very heavily used field, town hall field that's used for youth softball, junior baseball, club softball. The programs for recreation are out there constantly. We have North Parish Park um, and Park Street, a little basketball court. There's a beautiful picture of the turf field, which is going to be used within the next week. Um, that's the old picture that doesn't show the new bathroom facility, um, but it has all of everything in it. And there is some of the components that were put into the turf uh, bathroom facility. You can see the concession area, the, um, all the, the sink, <laughs> which we needed desperately, and the bathrooms, and the baby change station, which everyone seems to love. And it was um, well-renowned. Uh, last year was uh, very successful, the cleaning of it, um, the maintenance of it, the lighting of it, everything went fairly smoothly for the, you know, the opening of it. Did a good job taking care of any and all issues that came along. Uh, what we do for the community is anything that basically comes up that has to do with the town, generally Parks and Rec is involved in every aspect of it in some way, we the smaller big. So we do all kinds of things. So North Reading Welcomes is a program that uh, Lynn Clements developed with the local realtors. There's been over 500 delivered and uh, they're actively being delivered as we, not as we speak, but earlier when um, today they were being delivered. So it's a very popular program. Um, concert barbecues are gonna be starting up the end of June. Um, Children's Entertainment, that's the crowd we get. Very popular, award-winning bands. This woman here is out touring with all the um, country bands of uh, very high named bands. How we get the word out, our online registration is huge. Uh, the, the website, ipsertriverpark.org, Facebook, um, email blast, we have 6,000 members, so our brochures, banners, town hall office. If there's a way, we get it out there. Um, and here we go with our revenues. Um, we are looking for, we're expecting revenues in the amount of about 421,000. Um, it's a little, it's a decrease, um, and there's a reasons for some of the decreases. Leads, there's a decrease, uh, estimate, these are all estimate, of $8,400. Youth basketball doesn't use a town hall gym anymore, and all leagues have had some decreases. Um, I was just told that youth across the boys might have a 30% decrease this spring. I haven't even received their revenues yet, but a year baseball may be up, so not really sure. So we're hoping that things still come in somewhere in the range of where I anticipated. So we're kind of following that trend where the leagues are a little bit down. So um, same thing with Parks and Fields. We did have a loss of a club soccer team. Um, so I brought the revenues down for that. We're trying to make it up, but they're not being made up so much in the parks and fields, but where the open areas are, shifting them over to Lynn and Recreation, was trying to fill them with programming. So you see that more in programming um, opportunities that we're trying to establish. Um, enterprise, decrease of $500. We had a vending decrease. I'm bringing in a new vendor for the vending. Uh, Coca-Cola took this out. They didn't want them there, so I'm gonna be looking into Pepsi, but right now I anticipate it'll be less. Um, recreation. The reason why there's a decrease in recreation, it isn't because there, um, things are down, it's because we made a policy change. Um, we offer a lot of trips. Some of them are seven day trips. And they, let's say it's um, 
I'll just say ten thousand dollars. They give us ten thousand dollars. We only make a five percent commission on that. And when they do that, um, we we have to bring all the money in. We have to procure it and the whole bit. So we've decided that we're going to make it truly a commission agent. So we're just shifting, we're sending the money right over to the travel agent and we're getting a true revenue commission from it. So we're not going to see it in the revenue flow. We're going to see just the true profit of it through the, so therefore we're not moving money for 5%, um, which is not a lot of money uh, to move monies in and out and all the work and entail. That was a lot of work to bookkeep it, purchase order it, procure a check for it, um, keep track of it. This way it just shifts over there and they send us a check. Um, so that's the only reason for the decrease. So it's, you know, that's just to get things in line of where our policy have changed. Um, retained earnings, kind of budgeted $45,000. That, um, the, for the bulk of that is $50,000 that we budgeted for the IRP walkways for the outer walkways for fiscal year 20, uh, fiscal 19. Just to let you know, still we have the rec center still not yet not done should be done soon and the inner walkways was 37.5 um, if we do them together there is a savings that'll show in another slide um, we're hoping to realize that savings still the um, contractor is going to work with us we were going to try to get it all in one fiscal year but he's willing to put it into the two and realize our savings which would be about fifteen thousand dollars to save it so subsidy Request is 241790. That's to fund the three director positions, the salaries, uh, some buybacks and adjustments are in that number. Um, so this is the uh, revenue projection. That's the revenues, the retained earnings uh, put in for 45, and the subsidy request comes to the totals of 708520. Um, expenses, personnel. That personnel includes um, not only the directors but also the um, all our seasonal personnel. We we bring up in almost 30 people over the our peak months when we get into high July. We have so many instructors, we have parks personnel. Um, those numbers, we had to raise the rates to uh, address minimum wage, which is going up again in January. So we had to um, address that. So our numbers do go up through raises, minimum wage hikes, and in anything that we need more uh, programming. Services are, d um, are down, supplies are down, other charges and expenses, those are up, and those are just fluctuate. Uh, indirect costs, those are up. Those have to do with the Medicare costs that correlate to that personnel number. Um, large capital, the large capital plan um, is $50,000 that we've estimated. Um, and again, it says here, if we do all the walkways at the same time as one project, then the walkway total will be 71875 a 15625 saving. We we still want to remain with the fifty thousand dollar budget in the event the walkways are done as two separate projects due to factors we can't control. If for some reason we can't get the whole thing done, he wants to be able to do it all at one time. If for some reason we can't schedule both of them, I just want to keep the budget of the fifty thousand in there. Um, if we realize the fifteen thousand dollar savings, it goes back into retained anyway. So it's not a loss. So basically, we're not anticipating really any surplus. We're anticipating just spending some money. This just is a little slide that shows that um, the revenues uh, for 17 and 18 are actual revenues received. The 19 and 20 are ones that were projected. That's the budget projection. As, as you can see, uh, purple is recreation, the driving force behind the department as far as revenue stream is recreation. Enterprise just means our vending concession, very minimal. Uh, not a lot of money to be made in that. It's more of a customer service thing. Parks, you know, we float in there and try to, um, you know, go with what we can. Rentals, rentals are up in some aspects, down in others. We follow the trend. We try to put ourselves out there to rent. Um, and again, the budget subsidy of the 241 is only 0.36% of the whole um, total general fund revenue of the town. It's a very tiny portion that we asked for to fund the three directors that does all the work for the parks, recreation, and bringing the money. So that's what we asked for is to fund the three salaries. And there's my shameless <coughs> plug again. <laughs> uh, so again, that's a big fundraiser. Uh, these funds go towards improvements at the park. You're going to see um, there's going to be these, the 
Um, the metal shed that was over by the gazebo is gone. Now we are looking to uh, have the friends of gift us a nice shed from, it's like a, like a Reed's Ferry shed of sort that's going to be more in line with the area, which the memorial garden and the meditation garden that's over there and to look like it should be there uh, for storage for these big special town events. A lot of the town events happen over there and we need some storage over there. So that indeed um, is where we get the money from between that, the barbecues and our Disney character breakfast. Um, that's where those funds come from. So we budgeted $25,000 for this event trailer. It shows in the capital that's funded by friends of, um, we've kind of referred to it as a shed, but um, it is an event trailer that we got rid of. So um, other than that, that's what I have. Mr. Coberto. So I just want to highlight the work that Maureen and Lynn uh, and Marty put into their budget. So again, you know we asked each of the departments to scrutinize their budgets relative to what their needs were. And this is an instance where they identified that the need was less uh, with regard to their request. Uh, they've identified exactly what they need. They are asking for an increase in the subsidy that the general fund provides. As you know, I've not made a recommendation at this point in time, but I, I do think it's important to call out, as you've all seen, they really looked closely at the budget. You know, Liz and I met with Maureen, asked a number of questions, and I really feel that they've, they've done their homework to really um, align it with what their actual expenses are. Um, they are um, th there is a need, and we are looking, uh, working with the director at um, whether there are any administrative needs in the office, and that's something that may come back as part of the budget reconciliation down the road, but it's not in their request right now. There may be more to come to that on that in April. But thank you, Maureen. Thank you. Board members, same thing. Mrs. Mignapelli. Just to you too. Excellent job. And you know, you 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 made you kind of made a joke about that, but if there's something going on, it's very easy to find it out. And it's probably the most talked about department. I have kids, so maybe that's why, but just an exceptional job getting the word out, promoting what you're doing, and just a great job for the, for for all of you, your directors and, and your whole your whole team here too. So Quite a team effort. I mean, we we are we call ourselves a team. We we are a team. Yeah, so it's great. Can't do one without the other. Great work. Great use of social media to get to spread the word about what's going on too. It, yeah, re it really does touch the entire community. I mean, um, all the programming that you have, uh, uh, from zero to ninety-nine. It really is. You know, and you've got uh, again the concerts, the. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, everything that's going on involves a large segment of the community, and, uh, and I know it doesn't go unappreciated and unnoticed either. So it's uh, people take great pride, uh, but in the physical facilities too, and how well they're maintained. You know, to the park, uh, your managing of the uh, the turf field, able to generate revenue there is uh, significant. Uh, I can say, as a member of the athletic uh, subcommittee there, you know, what uh, Marty did to assist in getting that whole project completed down there, which wasn't easy. No. Um, and again, the, co the contribution made by the Friends of Park and Rec uh, helped complete that whole project down there, the concession stand and bathrooms, which has been a terrific addition, which is going to serve generations to come. So, you know, everything you've done is, and uh, continue to do is really uh, makes North Reading what it is. So, Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Anyone else? In the turf field, too, that we've already added a um, ice machine that was uh, donated by all the league entities as well. So no sooner was it in that we already had another improvement in it, an ice machine that's good for all the uh, leagues that are trying to deal with what they do, sell, and what have you. So um, we were able to get it from a local person who could get it for half the price, wouldn't charge us to put it in. So we have so many people that are so helpful that will do it next to nothing. Mr. Schultz and then Mr. Yeah, Mr. just real quick, the crowds you had at the barbecues last summer, I've never seen them that big before. I don't know if last summer was bigger than usual, but, and you guys have some great bands there. It's yeah. a great thing if people want to come out on a nice Wednesday night, just listen to some music. You get some really, and it's all different, like one week it'll be classic rock, one will be something else. Yeah. There's something for everyone, it's really, it's been a very nice event. Right, and we, we usually try to get Annie, she's the country band, but she literally is like rocking the world with all the, country stars and so it's like I have to say goodbye to her and go to another country band she's just too big for us now but you know we have a country band we have this type of band we have that and the children's entertainers too we try to have singers and puppets and dogs and bubbles and what have you so we plan it out so that there's a little something for every age so and you know thank 
Um, you know, a big thank you to the community that comes out and sponsors everything. And Maria Brown is really good about touching base with them. And if it wasn't for the sponsors, it wouldn't happen. Um, but all the bands are sponsored and all the children entertainment is sponsored. Um, we get the bread sponsored. We get, you know, people who donate food to us. So it ends up being just, it's just a huge community, you know, event that's so well loved. So. Mr. Messier. Uh, I just want to thank you, Maureen. Uh, the capital generated by the Hillview Commission that went into the park and the turf field, it's been a great investment, and Parks and Recreation has done a tremendous job in keeping that valued investment in, in first-class shape. Right. Thank you again for all your efforts. No, you're welcome. It's, it's, it's like the park. I mean, we try to we take pride in what we do, and it's also um, it's not threading you want to you want it to shine so it's a new it's a new facility you want to keep it that way so it's 10 years old this year at turf field well you know park and rec's near and dear to my heart that's where i started mm -hmm. 18 years ago 19 years ago um but i don't think what the community has a good appreciation for is that you know you're here tonight asking for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars to run something that we get so much value for Right. You know, and the friends of the dedication, the time they put in, all the things like those little things you <coughs> said, the donation of bread and the donation of this and that, that all saves the whole entire community money. Right. And I think out of all the departments, you have so much reach and a lot of volunteerism and a lot of generosity that gets overlooked in many cases. And we're here approving a, we're going to go to town meeting and approve a multi-million dollar budget. and. But people don't understand how much more this could be, right? If we didn't have the folks that are sitting back here, right? Um, and all of you, and I know you work hard, all of you paid employees, and you deserve even more. But not enough credit goes to the volunteerism and the generosity that makes Park and Rec really what it is. So it's pretty special. Uh, I know we I talk to so. other communities, and uh, <laughs> we have something special in North Reading. We high do. School volunteers. We have, like, I think we're probably the biggest department to get community service kids to do the community service in town. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. We get, like, we don't even have to look for them. They just come and sign up. And, and we, like, our Disney character event, we couldn't run it. We wouldn't be able to run it without high school kids. Any of our big events, it's all volunteer kids. Yeah. And, and it's really fun to work with them. And I think it gives them a lot, you mm -hmm. know, to work with the community. I think it's, really cool that the high school has that um, requirement and then the kids just come out and do it all. It's really a neat thing. Because we're that we feed them too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and the last thing I want to say is even my daughter had worked in the department and you should, to this day she's still one of her favorite jobs she ever had. But I, I think that the community, I wish we could have more jobs for our young mm -hmm. adults to take a job in the summer here work for the town of North Reading because they work with professionals. They get to see what it's like to really work in a a high tempo atmosphere and I think you don't realize how much of a benefit you give our young children when you give them those jobs. Mm -hmm. So I hope we get more and I hope other departments would consider doing summer internships in North Reading. I don't know why we don't have more. You know, we have engineers, we have an engineer here in town, why don't we have a, a summer intern for him? Why don't our budgets have those requests for summer interns? It's, it's a benefit both ways and I hope in the future we'll, we'll consider more of that. So right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions or? No, we're going to cut your budget though. Um, no. <laughs> right. no, it's great. Thank you. Treasurer and collector. You want to so say anything before? I think Rita wants to say something. Yeah. Would you mind going to the mic uh, in the podium? I'm sorry. I know. I'm sorry. But the folks at home really want to hear you. <laughs> Rita Mellon, 29, Abbott Road. I just, as a full-time uh, volunteer for about 40 years, I want to take this last budget opportunity to thank uh, Bob Masseri for all the years that I have worked with him on recreation. Sometimes when he accused me of being in his pocket taking money before I got here. <laughs> but for all the things, he's been a gentleman, he's been a, uh, a help, he's been a mentor to all of us, and since the Hillview Country Club, through finance and all the things that you've done, and as a selectman, I personally want to thank you and for the recreation for all the years that you've done everything with us. So thank you very, very much. And to Mr. Prisco, that started on recreation about 19 years ago when I begged you to join and take over the chairmanship, 
and you did that, and you brought a lot of your expertise to the parks and recreation. You two, as you know, are going to be sorely, sorely missed for everything you've done. So for the two of you, double the years, Mr. Uh, Masseri and Mr. Prisco, thank you. thank you very, very much for everything you've done for us. Oh, we appreciate it. And you called yourself a full-time volunteer. That's correct. <laughs> that's not, that was not an understatement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for the kind words. Okay, uh, who are we turning it over to Michael or Treasurer? Treasurer. Okay. Good evening. Want to just state who you are so the folks at home? Mary Ann McKay, I'm Treasurer Collector. Um, I have two budgets. I have my Treasurer budget, my Collector's budget. What's up? My um, Treasurer's budget. Um, the only two items that are in there are my assistant salary and my stipend. Uh, everything else falls under my Collector's budget. Sorry, I'm just getting to my budget book here. Yep, page 75 in the budget book. Go right ahead. Sorry. Um, so the treasurer's budget, like I, like I stated, um, has my stipend for being um, certified, and then my assistant uh, Moni's her um, salary for the year. Um, my collector's budget, that's my bigger budget, that has all of my staff in there, um, along with all of my expenses um, to, for the motor vehicle bills, all the um, postage, all my legal fees for um, Mr. Capoler, um, all the office supplies, bank supplies, travel, dues, that all falls under my collector's budget. Um, the only item um, that, um, only two um, items in my budget that were increased this year. Um, one of them was postage um, by $1,000, and one was the clothing allowance due to um, contractual. Um, it did go up in, in their contract, um, so that, those are the only two increases that I have this year. Any questions? She needs stamps. <laughs> So well, the postage did go, did go up. It went from 47 to 50 cents. So um, that, that's the anticipation that, and plus with the new construction that's going on in town as well, that's another reason why I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I need going up on my postage. So real estate collections, yes. we still tend to have about a million a year not collected. Is that, am, re am I reading that right? Um, 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 approximately, um, because of um, between the fees and all the, this will have the liens and everything else in it as well. So that's why it, it, it's usually about a million dollars. Yeah. Is but, that but I'm sorry. Is that normal? Um, yes, we we are aggressive in collections. We do send out numerous letters, um, and then we do advertise it and put liens on the property. And once it gets to that point. Um, we, we do get collections because no one wants to um, have liens on their property because then if they go to sell it, we have to get it. No one likes to have any advertising on the paper saying that they owe, they owe taxes. So we are very aggressive in sending out letters. We send out the four bills plus a demand bill, plus a reminder, plus an advertisement. So we send about six bills out before it actually gets advertised just to try to get the collections. Okay. Is there anything we can do to help? Or any suggestions for the board to take on this task? You know, so a yeah. million dollars sitting out there that is very important. I'm sure the FinCom would love to get their hands on. No, I'm serious. So if there's something we could do, right? Let, is you're, there? You're just waiting until something gets sold or refinanced, and you'll you'll get it at that point. Correct. And you get an interest on it. We do. Yeah. But I, I think you have the pretty good idea. It's the same individuals every year for the most part that let it lag. Correct. So. A a list, of, a list of known characters who, who yeah, delay payments. Yeah. Then a lot of people will wait until um, it does come to the, almost when we are advertising it. That's when we do see a lot. Um, right now we have about 30, I think it's between 25 and 30 um, that are outstanding right now that will get adver advertised. Um, we're in the process of doing that right now. The, um, Mr. Cabola, 
Um, our tactile attorney is in the process of um, checking all the legal um, documentation on that right now. So, wait, I'm sorry, we probably have like 50 um, in tax title right now, um, parcels, which we are in the process as well as trying to collect those. Mr. Masseri. We put in a new water system, new water meters, yes. and there have been a lot of probably changes that people are seeing as a result of it. Have you had any uh, complaints regarding the water bills? Um, we have, um, we personally haven't. Um, if there's any, um, if anybody calls regarding the meetings or if their bills are high, we usually send them off to uh, Mark in the water uh, department. He's I'll the say one the one question actually, from Mark. Yeah, he's the actually, the one well, that actually look at so if there's a leak or anything like that. Like, we'll tr try to help them troubleshoot. Um, before before the new meters were put in, before you could actually go online and look to see what your usage was, we would give them little tips on how, you know, different items, um, you know, put little dye in the back of your, you know, the, your tank to see if it's running during the night because a lot of people don't hear your toilet running. Um, we would help them with that, but to have the meter actually check, we would have to send it off to the water department. Anything else? Anyone else? And I apologize. I haven't asked for any comment this evening. I apologize. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Have a nice okay. We actually have, um, Sorry, one second, if you wouldn't mind. We actually have met with most of the department heads of the budgets that are being looked at tonight and discussed them as a committee. And in fact, in, with the exception of one or two budgets, uh, we've voted on them. Okay. Thank you. Assessor. Mrs. Carboni, there you are. How are you this evening? I am well. How Great. is everybody tonight? Fantastic. Thank you. The assessor's budget uh, in a whole didn't really change with the exception of three line items. Do we want to go line by line or just explain the increase? I think just explaining your increases would be fine. We had a chance to read through your budget. We read your goals, um, what you have planned for FY 2020. Uh, you, if you want to touch upon anything that you accomplished in 2019, then maybe just focus on um, what you plan to do in 2020 and how why that has an effect on your budget. That's it. So what is that? So the dues and membership was uh, has the most significant increase, and that amount is uh, $4,235. The reason for Bless the increase, we actually knew of this Bless increase last year. Our state camera, which is our appraisal system, has been obsolete and now offline. Bless Bless you. Therefore, we have chosen to go with Tyler IAS. Tyler IAS, their dues for the annual fee is $8,710 a year versus what State Camera was at 4250 I believe. So that's almost double. With that, uh, that's the system we have chosen, and um, we're well aware of that increase. I did just find out tonight uh, that that system will be converting at the end of April. So we are moving forward. The anticipation is that it will be completed by Memorial Day of 2019. That does not mean that we're sending a bill out until this system is satisfactory to our department and we have crossed every T and dotted every I possible. Jeez, I thought we were getting a freebie. 
No, out of the new system. Yeah, we knew what you meant. Thank you, though. So we've, um, we've been working on the conversion as far as making sure running reports and <coughs> checking data over the last 18 months to see if we can, you know, get a head start on all this. Okay. So that's, uh, that's the largest membership increase. The next one was the uh, interim adjustment reval. And the reason for this price increase is due to the Modernization Act under Baker and Polito of 2016, the assessor's office now does a revaluation every five years. So what that means is there's more work to do during the interim years. Our next full reval will be 2022. In my 10 years of being here, the reval company has never charged us, it never had an increase. This is the very first increase since I've been here. Personal property is the exact same case. It's a modest increase on a price per account. In other words, when we go to a business and we pick up the, uh, the new furniture, fixtures, and assets, the, it's a modest increase and a modest increase in the software support. And last but not least, the uh, clothing allowance. And that's, that's I didn't see it that. for the increases. Are there any questions? I just didn't see the clothing allowance increasing. $200. Yeah, I, I see it in the wording, but I didn't see it in the budget. I don't know what. Okay, I got it. I see it. Thank you. And any questions? Thank you. So we, um, we're going to move back up onto the agenda real quick and try to catch up on a few things that we did miss. And then we're going to go back to uh, try to catch up and then get 8.40, we'll have a joint meeting with the CPC. So are there um, board, board member reports? Any board member reports? No, no updates? Um, no good? updates. Okay. Just, just congratulate. Mel Webster. Yeah, I Good plan on. to do that. Thank him for his service to the town. He dedicated for all these yep. years. So Andy and I did go by the school committee meeting on, on our way here this evening at 5.30 to uh, say uh, go, goodbye to Mel. Thank him for his years of service on the school committee. Mr. Webster, uh, on behalf of the board, I thanked him. And, uh, if you have an opportunity to do it yourself, so I'm sure you're still around until Friday, is it? He'll still be here. Um, so, but again, 15 years in the school committee, he's certainly seen a lot of change, and it's been a pleasure working with Mel. Uh, he's a wonderful human being, uh, and he's a great communicator with social media. He's certainly he's done a great job, and we owe him a lot, and the children in the town are getting better educated for all his hard work. So we thanked him for that, and the, fac the facilities that we all see, and, um, you know, he worked so hard in all of them. Not not just the new high school, middle school, uh, the Batchelder, all the elementary schools, he put a tremendous amount of effort in them. So we thank him for his years of service, and certainly his wife, Kathy, for all the evenings she had to spend alone while Mel was out uh, trying to make our town better and uh, education better for our students. So a thank you goes out to her as well. Okay, so that's it, uh, public comment. Anyone here for public comment? Okay, next to discuss, oh, the town administrator vote and approve the signed town administrator employee agreement. So the town administrator's contract ends in June 30th, 2020. And we wanted to take the opportunity where there's a tremendous amount of opportunities outside of North Reading that have been opening. Um, and we've been looking at the the environment for town administrators, town managers throughout the Commonwealth. And we wanted to make a move now, the board wanted to make a move now to retain the town administrator long term. 
So we broached uh, an idea with him about extending his contract out another four years. So we have been working on this since uh, the beginning of January, and the board has uh, worked, had a lot of executive session discussions uh, going back and forth, and we've come to a contract agreement with Mr. Gilberto to extend his contract from June 30th, 2020, expiration to now June 30th, 2024. And the board has uh, finalized that agreement. We voted in executive session to bring to open session to approve it and sign it this evening. I'll leave it up to my board members if you'd like to make any comment. If not, we can take a motion. So just yes. Real briefly, Michael, we're, we're lucky to have you here, and uh, we're glad you're well. We reached an agreement, both sides worked out, and you're going to be uh, stuck with us for a while. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Larry? Just uh, a few comments, I guess. You know, I, I've been, I um, have the luxury and pleasure of working with uh, every town administrator uh, personally, except for the first two. I was a little bit younger then. But, uh, Were you even born then? I, I was born then, yeah, and actually, yeah. Actually, I knew the, I know, I've known all of them, but I've been able to work with all, every single one of them except for the first two. Uh, first two. And, you know, a, a few years back here, how long have you been here now? That'll be five years. Five years, time flies. But five, five years ago, you know, we were in a situation where we found it necessary to uh, uh, go out and search for, for a new town administrator. And, you know, we uh, had some very capable candidates uh, that we interviewed and called through and, and went over. And, uh, you know, we decided to, uh, to gamble a little bit with a young guy at the time uh, who had some great experience. Uh, coming in and still young, offer. Still. still a young still guy. Young. <laughs> He's a little grayer now, though. Uh, thanks to us. <laughs> yeah, thanks to us. But you no, know, but you know, Michael had uh, you know worked for the city of Worcester and then Tingsboro, and um, you know didn't may not have had the same level of experience, but uh, certainly interviewed well. Uh, recommendations were through the roof as far as uh, his capabilities and um, what they were. And I think at the time, you know, we. Um, we got him fairly at, at a very reasonable rate. Uh, over the last five years, and again, from my experiences working with him uh, closely and other board members here, uh, but also comparing and contrasting when we've had an awful lot of negotiations over the last <coughs> five years with other communities. And we see uh, what other communities uh, have for town administrators, town managers, um, the level of support staff that they have that our town administrator has not necessarily enjoyed and we're trying to augment that because it's necessary because we're running a multi-million dollar operation here. Um, but by far, I mean, I am uh, so impressed with uh, what we're getting for this guy. And I think the last contract that we, we signed with him, I think he sold himself a little bit short. We, we took advantage of that. Uh, but it's time to, uh, for us to, to make an adjustment to assure ourselves in this community that uh, the continuity that the administration lends for the community is, is critical. You know, people come and go from the board here. It's the administration and the administrator who's ever holding a position that really lends the continuity uh, for the community from budget season to budget season. And he's done an exceptional job, and I think it's important for us to ensure that uh, his tenure here is, uh, is extended, and I think we've successfully negotiated a contract which is um, in everybody's mutual best interest. So, uh, you know, I congratulate him on his performance up to this date, and look forward to continue to work with him and I am grateful that he's uh, willing to entertain uh, the opportunities being presented to him to, to work with us uh, for an extended period of time so I think it's in everybody's best interest and appreciate it. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Masseri. Uh, I've been on the board uh, we will be finishing my 15th year work with three town administrators and actually was on the search selection committee for two of them and by far, Mr. Gilberto has lived up to what I thought we were recommending to the board for approval. And the fact that he lives in the community has given him the opportunity to meet and work with everybody in our community and to understand our community. And I think the action the board has taken this evening is absolutely necessary to guarantee that Mr. Gilberto continues his tenure here as TA in North Reading. Thank you. 
This is Minnie Pelly. And just to echo what everyone's saying, I, I did not, however, work with any other previous TA but Mr. Gilberto, and I, I think that he is the quintessential professional. His professional competency level is outstanding, and I think one of the other things, again, he's someone that does so many things that are just done and unseen and unheard or unnoticed, but other than by us, and he does a tremendous amount of work, and he's also consistently reminding us how you know things affect the employees or to take that aspect into consideration not that we don't already but it's good for someone also to be, ha be bearing in mind the workforce here and, and how things how our decisions affect them but I, I'm I'm in agreement that um, he's a talent that we want to retain for as long as we can here he puts in a tremendous amount of effort around the clock you know he's we can reach him when he's away we can reach him when he's when he should be taking time off so we should thank his family as well for <laughs> for, for him being here but I agree that we we needed to modify the pay that we're providing him commensurate with what other professional town administrators in other communities are being paid or um, being courted to come over to their town's bar too. So, um, just want to thank you for your service here. Um, to to me, it's well worth every penny that we pay, um, and it's just just an ex exceptional job that you do for the town, and very de devoted to the town and to the people that work here as well. So, I think it's a good move for us. Thank you. Okay. You good, Andrew? We're done embarrassing. Mike. So, uh, <laughs> now, I just I have to say a few comments before we, <laughs> we get to it. You know, I've had the pleasure of uh, having an opportunity to work with two different town administrators. Um, and uh, Michael, I was here and was part of the process when we were using the Collins Center to interview the candidates. And um, I will be honest, I was very a little concerned that the young you know, the young buck over there and what he would provide, but I have to say he's exceeded and continues to exceed. And I think if you go back and you look at the board's review of Michael since he's arrived here, uh, he has scored almost a max on every one of his reviews. And that tells you something about how <coughs> valued he is. And we work with Michael every day, and the community may not see it, but there is a tremendous amount of value we get with this town administrator and his involvement the change that he's made, the energy that he brings, the staff has never, I believe, has never had more communication than we had before. And us as board members, the communication, and communication is so important because it could cost us a lot of money if we don't communicate right, if we don't show accountability, if we're not out there driving our goals forward and trying to achieve our objectives in our strategic plan. He, that's on the forefront of this town administrator, and I think us making this move now you well in a year in advance is a smart move it keeps him here it retains him because the market is increasing every day there's a lot of openings for good fantastic town administrators and he's being courted and rightfully so we're lucky to have him and he's and we should do everything we can to retain him and I believe in this contract we have done that and um, and I have I have um, I guess the words is I'm Looking forward to voting yes for this because I support it wholeheartedly, and I'm glad we were able to get it done in this time frame that we did it. So, no, no other comments. Just, uh, just one other comment. I, I think it's been seven administrators I've worked with uh, over the years, uh, but uh, we're not always, you know, a very diverse group of people here that you know have been thrust together by the voters, and we have different of, of opinion on, on many different issues. But there's unanimity in this particular. Uh, in this particular case, and that's a uh, testament, as you said, Mr. Chairman, to his ability to communicate well uh, with the members of the board, uh, keep us all informed, nobody feels left out. Nope. Um, and again, he offers us good um, professional advice, and lets the politicians make the political decisions, and he gives his recommendations based on his uh, professional uh, standards and ethics and uh, what he thinks is in the best interest of the community. So we're being served very well. Thank you. Thank your wife too for agreeing to let you do this for another. Uh, Actually, if she's watching, did you know that? Does she know he signed? It? I don't or know. I don't know. <laughs> we may see her pulling pretty quickly. 
<laughs> so, with, no further ado. With that, Mr. Chairman, let me make the motion. Please. And then Mr. Gilberto can comment. Mr. Chairman, I move to ratify and sign the employment agreement between the Town of North Reading and Michael P. Gilberto for a term beginning January 1st, 2019 and ending June 30th, 2024. Second. I have a motion and a second. I just want to say one more thing, two more things. First, I, I need to thank um, Mr. Collins, who counseled us through this entire process. <laughs> and he did a great job fencing off the town administrator. He made sure he wasn't in the loop in any way. Uh, and he supported this board well into many evenings and through hundreds of emails and an exchange of questions and Ms. Rourke as well providing us the financial uh, guidance to make sure that the agreements that we made we can the town can afford to do so I want to thank you both for your time on this because it wasn't just uh, just this board that worked hard on this new agreement it, we had us the support of the staff Michael staff and in the way they did it professionally where they were were able to uh, keep the town administrator from outside of those conversations I want to thank them for that so no, no other questions. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Mr. Unanimous. Okay. Would we are like now at the. I don't the know if he has any comment. Well, yeah. can we get Mike? Can I give you a minute? I want to give you a minute. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I really, uh, I, I appreciate the board's support. Um, I think we've accomplished much over the past five years, and I look forward to the accomplishments of the past five years. Um, my family and I are very happy yeah, here uh, living in town, and I'm very happy working in town, and I look forward to continuing that. So thank you for your confidence. Thank you. I am mean, going to ask you, if Mr. O'Leary, if we could just quickly take the vote to discharge and release um, 40 might, Main Street. That might not be quick. No? Okay. Never mind, because I wanted to, if we were going to do it, I was going to have the town clerk while she was here to notarize <laughs> the form but if you don't think it's gonna be quick well I just have a car I don't know why we're giving up another affordable unit I guess I don't have enough information maybe that's my I, fault. I, I don't know anything I, I, I feel bad I probably dropped the ball on this one but I please I'll, I'll offer what I am aware of so if you're looking at the <clears throat> packet there is a, an email from the executive director of the Housing Authority describing what um, what what they're asking for and it does relate to an affordable housing unit um, being uh, uh, the, the, uh, a home fund, the federal fund, for federally funded subsidy being discharged. Um, this is something that came up uh, roughly 18 months ago for another unit, um, I believe on Main Street, uh, that the Housing Authority requested of us. They were here that evening. Uh, I don't see anybody in the audience from the Housing Authority. Um, they were here to describe kind of more of the situation. So if there are questions, it might be worthwhile to invite them to our next meeting to, to maybe present a little more about what they're looking for. If there's no urgency, I think that's probably Thank you. It, it appears to be there is some urgency. But by the same token, I think we should have a, a more clear understanding as to <coughs> why we were looking for more affordable units. They have these already under their care, custody, and control. and. It, some reason I don't recall why we agreed to do so it about 18 months ago. Why do we give them up? What? Just I, I don't recall. But typically, well, you said we've done it before. So we had one uh, in a similar circumstance. Again, it was between 18 months and two years ago that, that, that it came up where the housing authority was looking to sell the property to a private buyer. And in order for the property to be conveyed, there needed to be a discharge on a federal loan that the, the, the board needed to sign off on. Um, I'd. Uh, you know, I, I would suggest that it might be advantageous to ask the housing authority to okay. provide some more information. I think that's a problem. Okay. I, I would note this, this unit was on our affordable housing count um, up until 2013. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why it came off at that point in time. It may relate to the subsidy or subsidy level at that point. Um, I, I know that there's some sort of financial consideration or impact on the housing authority, but I think that they would be able to speak better to that. All right, uh, next subject is a uh, joint reappointment with the Community Planning Commission, Economic Development Committee, and I believe we have just one person, Mr. Peter Beale, I think we, is up for? Correct. So if it really doesn't need to be much of a discussion, we'll just take a motion and we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Chairman, I move to jointly reappoint Peter Beal Jr. as a member of to the Economic Development Committee for a term to expire March 3rd, 2022. Second. I have a motion and a second. 
Any discussion? I'll just say that uh, Mr. Bale has been a great asset on the team, on the community, uh, and the EDC. He's currently our chairperson, doing a great job. So I hope everyone supports uh, reappointing Mr. Beal. So, so if you want to roll call, so the chairman wants to roll call his uh, the CPC. Just like a roll call vote uh, for Peter Beal to uh, remain on the EDC. Uh, Ryan, favor. Aye. Chris. Yes. Aye. Okay. And myself, aye as well. Okay. Mr. Chairman for our board. Yes. Uh, I vote Mr. aye. Mr. Masseri. Aye. Mr. Ms. Schultz. Aye. Mr. Mignapelli. Mr. Beal. And the chair votes Mr. Beal. Thank you. So we threw one thing on the discussion real quick, and I only wanted the board members to be aware of it. We had a, Warren and I, my, Mr. Gilberto and Daniel McKnight and I had a, a brief discussion about 66 Main Street, and that's the old Heffron property. Uh, and I believe, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Warren. How about that? And then okay. I'll jump in. Okay, well, we did have a discussion about it. It, it, uh, it appears that there's uh, perhaps an opportunity here, but one that we may want to um, <clears throat> look into. There are a number of possibilities of use of this property, but during that meeting, um, um, we talked about the fact that there's a, a, a facilities a study that's going on that uh, has just begun, it hasn't been completed, and it, that this property may provide a, a location for uh, a municipal facility, but there are a couple of other possibilities. So what we would like to do at this point is perhaps ask the board to ask the uh, Board of Selectmen here to um, put it out to a couple of the different committees, such as the Facilities Management uh, and the, um, the EDC and, and a couple of others or anybody else that you think might be interested in using this property and see if we can get some feedback from them, because we think that perhaps it might have a use, a development use that might be uh, beneficial to the town. So I don't want to get into a, a lengthy discussion, discussion on this subject tonight. I just wanted to, if we could maybe get some feedback from some of the board members and then we could maybe structure another meeting somewhere in between now and when we get to our May meetings. Um, but I appreciate you bringing forward. I believe this, the owner has sort of an internal schedule somewhere around June. You'd like to get an idea of what the town may he, want to do? Okay, just, yeah, he's, there's actually a, uh, on, we have on file a sort of a, 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 um, a, a plan that's a, uh, that's kind of a proposed plan that he put together that shows three buildings with some mixed use on this, on this property. <clears throat> but I don't know that he, um, that he's interested actually in pursuing that. I think he did it as an exercise to see what could be done. Um, so I think that I think you'd be very amenable to having the town do something with it, if we were if we could if we were interested in doing it. We would have to the town would of course had to have to put a little skin in the game. They'd have to get involved in this uh, to some extent. So that's why uh, when I talked to uh, uh, Mr. Gilberto and to Mikey, we we um, we thought we might put it out there to the some of the committees that we have already looking into some of these things and see if we could get some feedback to see if we get some interest. But by the same token. It kind of does fall in line with some of the um, um, some of the suggestions and some of the recommendations by the MAPC from all of the studies that we've done lately. So it does fall into a couple of those categories. So um, that might probably. be worthwhile looking into. I know you, we're, we're pressed for time, but uh, are you saying that the owner wants to sell the land to us? I'm not well, sure what you mean by skin in the game. Yeah, there's, there's, well, there's a couple of possibilities. The initially, what my initial uh, request to meet was to find out if the town had any interest in, in, in getting involved in it at all, because he would like it. He would like to see something happen there. The Heffron name's been in, around for a long time. He's really, um, would like a legacy of some kind in that this particular location, which won't happen if he just sells it off to somebody else. So looking at that, uh, it, and the fact that from our MBPC things, we <coughs> were looking for we were looking for a location that might be usable to create something a little more something a little more centralized for the town, and this site kind of fits that that um, kind of fits that requirement. So. Uh, before we did anything, though, um, you know, we really need to see if this is something that the town has any interest in before we look at it any further. Mr. Schultz. 
Um, my initial reaction is I don't know if, the, if as a town we should be in the business of developing property, but I think there's no harm in sending these out to the subcommittees to see if there is, you know, I just, I don't think we should be developing mm -hmm. the developments or property, what have you, but if there is a need out there, because mm -hmm. I, I understand these buildings are basically teardowns that are on the premises now. Yep. So you're basically buying the land. Um, that hasn't always gone well for us as a town in the past. <laughs> um, I'm trying to be kind about it. So, mm. but I guess if there was a, you know, if a subcommittee said there's a pressing need, I'd be willing to listen. But mm. it just, and I'm just one of five. I mean, everybody else could disagree with me. I don't, I don't know. Mr. Larry, I have. Uh, I, I think you know this particular parcel, along with the Stop and Shop parcel, are a uh, a keystone to economic development on 28. And and I. A, a little different opinion. I, I think that the town is going to have to take some sort of an initiative to promote some economic development on, on Route 28 uh, to facilitate uh, some action, some action out there. Um, you know, that being said, I know we were talking about purchasing the, um, the water company, that we did reach out to Stop and Shop, and there was a, an indication that they would be willing to talk about some sort of a, a lease to option, at least option purchase for the town if we were interested in leasing a stop shop with a, with a, a potential for, to purchase it you know, after 2025 or 2026. Uh, so maybe in conjunction with um, that in mind, along with uh, this offering against so long as Mr. Stanford's not in any real hurry because the wheels of government turn rather slowly, Warren, as you're well aware. Yep. Um, you know, but again, it may be an opportunity for us to, to again, uh, it's directly adjoining that stop and shop property. I think if the town's going to um, get involved, and I think they are going to need to get involved if we're going to promote some economic development uh, in the short term rather than the long term, you know, this may be an opportunity. So I, I too think that you know we should refer it to some mm -hmm. bodies, you know, to to take a look and see how it may fit in. And again, the MAPC plan has uh, given us a roadmap. Um, we're about to appoint some people to a committee to look at our own facilities. I mean. We have some aging facilities here that we're looking to either invest in or replace, uh, and this may, may assist us in fitting it in. Two, so. two quick points would be that, uh, you know, we get a magazine called Planning Magazine. We get it basically 10 times a year, and I read through all these articles, and um, there are a lot of communities that have done something like this, getting involved in partnering. doesn't mean the town becomes a developer. The town becomes an enabler, and then, a, and then they partner with the developers, and that's the kind of a thing that can provide for the town a, a, a project they'd never be able to do on their own. But the town's not the developer, see. So um, in this, um, I, I think there's a possibility, and again, I would not want to speak for him, but I've spoken to him many times about it, for actually for almost three years now he's talked to me about this. So, so um, um, I would uh, probably want, if, 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 we, if we identified the willingness to move forward on a project like this, then I would probably want him to sit down with the board and, and, and talk about the different options that he sees as, as viable for him. And, uh, and I think that if we, he saw that the town was going to move in that direction, that he might be willing to, to wait. So I'd just like to share with my conversation I had with Mr. Pierce today briefly, and then we can come to an end, because you know, I, I was against this idea. I, I really am, because I don't think the town should be in the business of buying this property and developing it for commercial use. Um, we have an EDC. We have find we have money dedicated to the EDC to fund. We have a, uh, a commercial real estate consultant that we have access to. I think we should refer this to them, and I think we can be partners mm -hmm. with all the abutting uh, commercial property owners and help them provide guidance, build a plan with them, without the town have to acquire any of these properties. I think we have a really good feel for where we are with our wastewater and how that could have changed all these, discussing, mm -hmm. these discussions. And I think we should allow the EDC to get into this and, and provide a recommendation. But I just don't think the town should be in the business of acquiring properties and development commercially. I just think it's a bad idea. This is 2.2 acres, okay? There's really not a lot we can do there. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Well, I think it needs to it needs to dovetail with the uh, facilities master plan committee yep. that we're talking about. Though. We talked about that you know, this afternoon. So, so I mean, yeah, I think it, it needs to dovetail with that because yeah. uh, you know we have very limited options in relation to you know where can we relocate 
and again, we have this particular parcel here, which is like nine acres, you know, that, you know, if you build something somewhere else, this then becomes available for sale to help offset the cost of something else. And so that's where we, you may be looking to invest. And again, it could be a partnership in relation to, uh, it doesn't just have to be strictly municipal purposes on, on a site, but uh, the town could acquire and then partner with developers uh, to do just that, develop it for mixed use in municipal services. So, you know, I, I think the, uh, I think we need to, you know, get going with this uh, facilities master plan committee, uh, charge them with the responsibility of taking a look at this, this option included, uh, and then maybe the economic development committee. Uh, but I think our facilities master plan has to come first, see yep. how it dovetails with it. If I, the, um, <coughs> my, my, I guess I would say, one of the examples I would give you is up the street we put in a, a building that's basically a storage building and we, we battled with them some to get them to put some um, some retail, small retail stores along the front in order to get something out of it. But that was, that was totally allowed. I mean, they actually wouldn't have had to do that, but they did do it for us. So, um, so we have since made a zone so we won't get any more storage facilities. But the point about this is that if we don't do something ourselves here, if we don't make some kind of an attempt to control what happens here, what we'll end up with is something like that. Well, uh, trucking company again, or something I, Mr. You know, that we just really don't want. The uh, community has a community planning commission. It's an elected body. And I think it's their responsibility to go through the detail and make a presentation, I agree that we have to make the final decision. Yeah. But I, I'd like to see more facts and options of what we have before I make any final decision on what to do or not to do. Yeah. I, I know I certainly won't be here when this gets addressed. And I really had recommended that they wait until the next board is here. Because I think this is a bigger picture discussion with a different philosophy with different board members. I, I just... The, the timing is not great. Um, you know, we only have three meetings left. I don't think we can make a big, you know. Yeah, I don't. And think I know you. I know Mr. Heffron is under a timeline of, of June, but I, I just don't. It might be a self-imposed timeline. So let's let's see. If I, I recommend, yeah, we should you should wait till the next board is in place, though. I think before you really. T but you guys, Mr. Messier is right. I mean, you are a CPC, and I think you should do the same. I think you should elect your new board member, get him elected, or mm -hmm. her elected, uh, whomever it is, and, and, and then take this one on, uh, a bigger picture. Yeah, don't no forget problem. you have an EDC, and I think you should at least allow them to participate in the discussion. Oh, yeah. Okay? Thank you very Anything much else? for your consideration. Just, yeah. Real briefly, I just, to dovetail on it, I am a little concerned about the talk of like that property and the stop and shop property of doing this. Why would we want to take two of the most desirable commercial properties and make them municipal properties? I mean, oh, that's, I that's not exactly the plan at all. Okay, I just want to make sure because yeah, if we yeah, get no, sewers down 28. No, I mean, if there was. I'm if, sorry, go ahead. If you were to, okay, hypothetically, and this is again, the, the um, MAPC people brought this forward that if we had a site that we, could, that we could develop where we could put a building, say a four story building on that property, where we could have some retail boutique stores on the first floor, which I've had a couple of people ask me about actually lately. Why don't we have any of those? Well, you could put those on the first floor. Second, third floor could be town offices. Fourth floor could be doctors, you know, lawyers, whatever, you know, people who have office kind of things. And um, that would give, that would be a place where the people in town could go, where they could do more than just go to the town hall and they could shop and there'd be access, there'd be walking access to a restaurant, to all kinds of Have you seen locations. other towns do, I've never seen a mixed use town hall. Have you, have you seen other towns do that? Um, I haven't really I, looked I, into that. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I really okay. think yeah. that this isn't the time right now. We have a, why we're really on our time why, crunch you know, it's, it's, you, you, The point is, Mr. Missouri's point is well taken. So why don't you let us pursue this a little? Yeah. Right. And um, I, But um, I'm glad to see there's some interest in it because if there wasn't any interest whatsoever, we would just walk away. Yeah. But I think no. that would be a mistake based this on... Is a, this is an important gender time. item. It needs more discussion. Right. Certainly not in a 10 so Let us work on it and bring something back to you. How's that? That, that would good. be great. Yep. Yep. Okay, now we're going to get to the uh, FY 2020 budget hearings. We have finance and accounting next, and uh, IT and batting cleanup, town clerk. Well, 15 minutes behind schedule. I apologize, but we're trying to catch up. So, thank you, CPC members. Thank you. 
Um, Ms. Rourke is up on deck, up the bat. And uh, I hope you don't mind while you're talking. I may sneak out, use the facilities, and I'll be right back. I don't mean to be rude. But please continue. One is titled um, Finance, which uh, consists of my salary as well as the Assistant Finance Director's uh, salary. And the, I will wait for any questions on that. Does anybody have any questions? Do you want to go through any more specifics with regard to your requests? Uh, for the finance division, we're not requesting anything additional um, for FY20. Anybody on finance committee have any requests? Have any questions? We've already we've already reviewed this. And Elizabeth, we had our questions uh, answered. Where are we with Munis? aspect of munis are you referring well, to I, I, you know obviously it's a bunch of modules are we all caught up with the things that we believe we need or are there still things laying out there that we should be pursuing there are no and i know some of that would be in the capital budget but sure there are no um further purchases that are necessary meaning of um new products within munis we um, have some things that we need to um, basically improve and um, utilize. Um, there's uh, some, some of them that we are underutilizing uh, within the HR module and the payroll module. Uh, so as discussed, we will be implementing those this fiscal year. Does our annual license agreement with them allow automatic updates or? Yes, so okay. we pay, you know, a large annual support fee that is housed in the IT budget and it includes the modules that I just spoke about um, and there will be no added support cost for increasing usage within those modules. Um, and <coughs> about every other year, Munis requires that we upgrade to the newest um, version. They stop supporting the previous versions, and that's covered within our support costs. Okay, we're going to be talking to IT a little later. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Thank you. Sorry. If no further questions, I will move on to accounting. Right. Is it hot in here or is it just me? It's hot. It's freezing. Freezing. Please move on to accounting. Sorry. Other than contractual increases within the accounting department, um, there are no other increases for FY20. Okay. Finance committee, any questions? No? Okay. That's it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. IT. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, you just need to state your name for the record. Sure, no, uh, I'm Matthew Cooper, the uh, IT director. So the folks at home know who is speaking. Thank you. Um, ahead, I tried to basically pick my battles very carefully. If I didn't have to ask for anything, I didn't. I'd rather take the opportunities to ask for the increases when I absolutely need it. Uh, as you see, there's only a uh, couple of minor increases. Uh, do you have any questions regarding them? Matthew, uh, <coughs> Microsoft is uh, stopping support of Windows 7 at the end of this year, calendar year. From a security point of view, that means there'll be no more security patches. Not that you can't 
continue to use it. So what action are, are we taking and what's in the budget to deal with migrating to Windows 10? And <coughs> once in 10, what issues will we have with other applications? Uh, as a rule, the as computers are phased out, my, uh, most of the major vendors have not been allowing you to purchase anything in Windows 7. So all the machines coming through are Windows 10, right. which means the town is just progressively phasing out the old Windows 7 machines as they either age out or encounter the uh, mechanical problems. So uh, in relatively short order, the town will be switched over to Windows 10 exclusively. A lot of, you know, I'm in the IT business, and a lot of our customers that have bought Windows 7 systems that are only a year or two old, we're doing Windows 10 upgrade rather than replacing the hardware itself along with the uh, operating system. So what are you doing? As a rule, we are sticking to the replacing the computer as the computers we have with Windows 7 are uh, a few years old and coming up to the end of their hardware refresh period. If I may, as part of the annual computer replacement plan, we are replacing the bulk of computers annually. Um, so we, uh, many users are already, already. on Windows 10. Okay. We're not purchasing <coughs> Windows 7 machines, and we haven't been for two Since years. Since I got here, basically. Right. So probably about two years we have not purchased. All right. So the approach you're taking is basically we're going to replace the hardware, too, because these machines are several Eight, years no. old. Exactly. Okay. Mrs. Minipelli. So one of your larger increases is that professional services data processing can you just explain a little bit of that it looks like yes it's an increase of twenty four thousand dollars for that yes uh, that's part of an ongoing effort to pull it pull in IT costs from around the organization in this case it's the online permitting system that will soon be going in for building mr. Blair. just uh, in relation to the replacement of the INET or building of the INET, right? Where are we at? What do you anticipate increased costs to be? Uh, how's it gonna be, how are we implementing it? Uh, we're engaging with a, a third party by the name of Contract. Uh, this is basically what they do for both pr public and private organizations. Uh, I've been in touch with the vendor in the past couple of days, and we're slotted to start putting down a hard schedule in the immediate future. Maybe in the next couple of weeks, Tom's. Okay. And the, and the financing of it? Uh, that is, was is a capital, capital request from cap last year. Yeah. Right? Capital yep. request. Okay. So the money's already been appropriated. Yep. Everything's on schedule and on budget. And oh, yes. Yeah, Lovely. And then the, the funds that we're receiving from the two vendors uh, assisting. We have already received the $75,000 um, from one of the vendors. We have not received the second um, payment from the other vendor. Um, Verizon. We have not received that payment as of, as of today. So those funds will be used towards this capital project. So good. So we're right on target. Right on target. Right. Thank you. Matt, uh, yes, sir. just one observation mm -hmm. as I'm departing here, I would just let you know things have come a long way and you right. certainly have continued to keep, uh, take, we have made a commitment to the investment, right, to reinvest in our technology. But one of the things I've really noticed, and I'll give you an example, I was over in Mrs. Knight's office and you know, she has this screen about this big and she is looking at drawings all day long. She's doing spreadsheets and stuff like that. And when we go through the evaluation of deciding who gets what, do we take into account the types of work individuals do? <coughs> so in code, code enforcement, you know, they should have the larger screens that they can see those plans, so they can, you know, see the stuff. You know, things are becoming more technical. So we're getting people submitting plans, building houses, building massive developments with a lot of technology in them. So if I could ask, if we could just invest in the employees, just get them the screens they need. This stuff's very inexpensive. 
But Mrs. McKnight, and, the, and there's a few others in town, I don't just say her, but I'm just using her example. It's literally this big, and she's, her and I were looking at a plan the other day, and I'm like, can you zoom that in? And it took her about 10, 15 minutes to get it zoomed in, and then zoom it back out so we could read the rest of the stuff. You know, that, that's just, labor is, you know, time is valuable. And if we could just make decisions that help us, our, you, our employees, Oh, yes. off, the, off the soapbox, I think you got the message. No, no, it's, it, it, I'm happy to, that's something we've been steadily doing as folks either, they'll come to me with a need, they'll either put something to the help desk or they'll approach me directly yeah. with a request for Let, me, let me just share this with you, I don't mean to cut you off, Matt, yes. but there's a lot of employees around, town, around here, they don't, su they suffer in silence. They won't say anything because they just, uh, they're happy with what they have, but I think we, as decision makers, as managers and leaders, you have to go and look at their equipment that we're providing our staff and say, this doesn't make sense. We need to give them the right tools because they're not going to ask for it because you know what? A lot of them don't complain. They, they don't, they'll just live with it because they believe, you know what? They're happy with what they have. But it's not right and we just need to, we're going out and spending all this money on things. Let's, let's make sure the right departments are getting the right screens because I've been around and I've seen screens, double screens in a lot of different places and it don't even make sense to me. So if we could just allocate the resources in the right areas where we, you know, things are getting more challenging, we need to make sure these people have the right tools to make decisions, okay? Sure. Uh, if we could do that, I'd really appreciate it. Even if you have to come back and make it a budget request and to add that money for those types of things, but somebody needs to do that evaluation because you do have staff here that won't tell you. They just won't, they're just not, they're not complainers. They just put their head down every day and go to work. So that's it, everything else looks great. Thank you. Matthew, I have one uh, question, and maybe I missed part of it. Uh, there was a $24,000 increase for uh, professional services data processing. Could yes. you provide some detail on that? Absolutely, yes. Uh, we are taking on the cost of the permitting software for the building department. Um, yeah. It's the annual support cost. I mean, is it change in programs or? The permitting software is brand new um, and has not gone live yet, and it's the annual support fee for the permitting software. So this is this a one-term, one-time spike cost. or? This is what Jerry was talking about. Yeah, okay. It's the, it's the annual cost. Right. It's not the additional cost for the right. permitting okay. software. This is right. the annual support cost. Thank you. It, but Mr. Chairman, I'd like to echo your, your comments of it. It's very astute of you to, to mention that because I, I agree. I mean, there is a need in some of our departments for something as big as yeah. that. Something yeah. as big as that. Yeah. You know, yeah. to to work on the. I mean, the, the, the development, the plans. The, um, it, it's actually in process now. Uh, when working on uh, allowing folks to walk off on the device just like this, and be able to show a one-to-one -one display of a large drawing. For example, plans, blueprints, what have you, so that there's not a bunch of people staring and scrolling in panic. And the ability to simply mark, if there's an issue with a contractor, mark, send them the, the commented copy and send them on their way. Yeah, but yeah, but mark of a code enforcement or, uh, or Danielle, you know, they, they need they need some little bit oh, of tools. Even, even over the fire department, you know, yeah. um, Deputy Chief Galvin, you know, he has to look at a lot of plans, right, in his, in his roles and responsibilities. He, we should make sure he has the right screens, the right technology, be able to zoom in, because the things are getting more technical, more challenging. There's so much being loaded into these buildings now, and we just need to make sure that we can see it, understand it. And so when we go out and we sign off on it, we know what the heck we're signing off on. And, uh, and quite frankly, we're all getting older, and we shouldn't have to, you know, squint and be getting these little screens right up in our face. So, I mean, the technology's out there, it's very simple. Yes. So, um, I just wanna ask a question of you as leading the IT department. So, with, it seems like there's a lot of risky systems implementation activity going on in the town this year, and do you think from your perspective you have enough staff to support all the technical work going on in town? I mean, it's, it, this is a light, you know, quite frankly, a really light budget for an IT department. So I'm just saying, do you feel comfortable? Yes, part right. of our professional right. services include uh, pulling in contractor help when necessary to help supplement. So if do, things do get a pat on the heavier involved side, 
we have funds available to uh, bring in extra manpower. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Mrs. Stats, batting cleanup. We saved the best for last, okay? Just so you, know. you waited around for a reason. <laughs> I know, I feel bad. <laughs> I failed as a chair tonight. So I just have a, a short PowerPoint sure. to, again just to illustrate um, <coughs> the situation and for the board's consideration. Uh, it is all good because my budget does go down this year. <laughs> so thanks to the fewer number of elections once again. So it is the best for last. So, um, so what you have and you probably received already was just our, you know, program description, mission statement, the office responsibilities, and that, you know, just, uh, is basically what you all are aware of and uh, doesn't fluctuate too much from year to year. Just, we do add a few things like, um, liaisons for the open meeting law, division of open government, or census, um, public records access officer, things like that. Um, but almost all of our responsibilities are based on statutes and uh, the law, and so they are pretty well defined for the clerk's office. Um, our staffing stays stable. Uh, the full-time personnel are myself, the assistant town clerk, and the secretary. And then, of course, we have a force of about 70 plus or minus election staff um, who, you know, some, you know, a lot of them have been there for a long, long time and we are always getting new faces and new people who are anxious to help us and uh, I just can't say enough about the election staff because they're so um, willing and eager to work. Uh, they are just wonderfully compliant and uh, very, very helpful. So I feel very fortunate to have such dedicated people at every election and every training session. I, I can't say enough about them. And we are, our daily work is supplemented by two senior program staffers who work on the senior rebate program. And again, these persons, uh, have been with us for a great number of years. They know our routine. They come in, they do the work. They're just wonderful people. They happen to be election workers as well, so they know the whole uh, overall view of the department. Um, they work a lot now during census time to help us just sort through the mail. They scan in uh, census forms that don't require any changes just so we can update the year of return for everyone. Um, and again, they just have really tremendously helped us so that we can uh, all concentrate on other areas of the office. But um, without their assistance, we would be struggling too because there's a lot of paperwork that comes through our office. Um, so I'm, I want to give a shout out especially to Camille Welsh and Ann Casey for the help that they provide us. And in the past, also Edith Graham, who uh, you know retired from the program a couple of years ago. But the three of them uh, have always been indispensable for us. Um, our primary statute of responsibilities, again, are, are listed here and you folks are well aware of them, so I'm not going to reiterate them. Um, elections and census and town meetings cover an awful lot of our statutory responsibilities and then of course we go into vital records and licensing and things like that. Does anyone have any questions about some of those first before we move on? <coughs> I don't want to take up all your time. Um, the big uh, differences are from this current fiscal year, we have three elections in the budget versus two in fiscal year 20. 
So that makes the overall budget fluctuate, both records and elections. Records to a lesser degree, but certainly elections to a good portion. Um, in FY19, where we're now at, uh, we're coming up to our last election with the May town election, but we've gone through the September 18th state primary, the November 18th state election, which included two weeks of early voting. And as I mentioned last year, that really adds on the cost of like another whole election to the process. Um, we were lucky, of course, that the state auditor's office has declared early voting an unfunded mandate. So we did recoup all of our all of our costs for election personnel that were that were um, that handled the process during normal working hours of the town hall. We chose to have some additional hours for evenings and Saturday, which was not reimbursable because it wasn't mandated. It was encouraged, but not mandated. But that's well worth um, the cost, you know, because of the service it provided to the community. So our election uh, personnel costs were all recouped. Things that weren't, as I said, were like the two Tuesday evening uh, that we stayed open from four to seven, and the one Saturday during the um, early voting period where we were open for four hours from 10 to two. And we also had police details during those extended hours only when the town hall was closed. I do not like to uh, have ballots and elections running without a police officer as we normally do. Um, and uh, I think there's a security issue with it and I think it's an important function. But luckily also, uh, the Secretary of State had a grant program for communities that opted to be open at some portion during that middle weekend. And uh, because we were open for that time period, we got an additional $1,300 for that time, which really covered the cost for what the state auditor's office did reimburse us for or uh, agreed to reimbursement for. So all in all, uh, it worked out, I think, very well. Does anyone have any questions on Mr. O'Leary. Um, what about early voting for town elections? Where's well, of course, right now the statute only says um, for state elections. Our understanding is that the Secretary of State is going to be filing some legislation, which I'll get into when we talk about the budget a little bit, that would be for early voting for the presidential primary to a lesser degree in March of 2020. Um, I, you know, th those costs would not be reimbursed, I obviously. Yeah. Right. I think that it, it certainly is up to the board. I think that I would like to personally see um, what the regulations are for the, state, the presidential primary. We know it's going to be a shorter period. Um, our understanding is it'll probably be for a one week period. Um, I think I would like to see what they promulgate and mimic something like that if the board would like to go with early voting for the town election. I would hate to go in to uh, act, you know, requesting a special act to have uh, early voting for the town election and have it be something different than what the, the uh, public is, will be used to for another election. If it can at all mimic something that will be in place already, I think that would be the best choice than have differences in hours, uh, periods of time, procedures. So I think I think um, that should be a conversation for probably the next budget. You know, in a town meeting after the presidential primary, we'd like to see how that's going to work. If it in fact passes, how it's going to work, how well it'll be received by the public. Um, and then the board could make a decision on going forward with that. Uh, just to keep in mind that uh, state elections and presidential primaries draw out the biggest crowds. The town election has not fared so well with turnout. And so when you're talking about um, offering early voting, both state elections where we have held early voting, it has been documented that it didn't actually increase the voter turnout, it just allowed it to be a convenience for the public, definitely for providing voting for a two-week period versus a one-day period. 
So I think there's a lot of factors that have to be looked at for that. Um, is it worth you know, the cost of it to run it, let's say, for a week before the town election? Um, things to consider. But and, it, you know, more than anything, I'd like to see what is offered by the state, what might pass through the legislation for the presidential primary, because I, I do believe it's going to be for a one-week period that they're going for, and see what they determine to be the, the protocol, the standards, the procedures for running that. And then if the board chooses to go forward, you know, something, uh, it, it may have to be special legislation to say that we would follow the same guidelines as the presidential primary. By then, they may be making amendments to the law in general that put it as a local option, right. you know. So there's different factors, I'm sure, coming yeah, down. I guess that's what I was wondering. Was there, is there any talk about local option legislation being filed yet? I have you heard, heard it through that. your clerks association? Or? No, I have not heard that yet. The, the most we've heard right now is for the uh, yeah. presidential primary. But I think that it would be coming after that. I think they probably want to see how this fares. Yeah. So I anticipate it happening. I don't know how soon. But, you know, it's like that. You know, you open that door that little bit and people get used to it or they like it, they find it a convenience. And, um, you know, I, I do see that happening. It's but like that saying, you can never go back. No, you know? I know. But I, I just want to say, though, that, you know, I took advantage of voting early in a couple of different elections now. and. Uh, Again, it is convenient, it is. and I think uh, the way that you've implemented it and the staff that you've had in place have made it seamless and worked worked, worked, worked extremely well. So, yeah, feedback it, was good. Kudos really to you and your staff and, yeah. and implementing it, and, and I think it's uh, and it's, it's, I think it's good. It is a tremendous benefit to a lot of people, you right. know. But there's always just to make sure people realize there's always absentee voting too, you know. And absentee voting generally starts about a week ahead of early voting. Ballots are in about three weeks ahead for absentee voting. So there's always an option for people who can't make it to the polls. You know, no one is, is prohibited from voting because there are options under the law. Mr. Schultz. Barb, good question for you. How, you know how much we spent last year that was not reimbursable for early election? Did you just say about thirteen hundred dollars? Thirteen hundred was the cost for um, the Tuesday nights and the Saturday. The yeah, the extra hours I would say. Thirteen hundred dollars. Um, no, thirteen hundred dollars was our reimbursement. We covered the cost um, through the grant. Mm -hmm. So our total um, personnel cost were, including my office staff overtime, were $5,506, um, with the, uh, so we were recouping $6,806 exactly. And so that was the 1300 over, which really covered the extra cost. So that's what it only cost $1,300. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, to go they, over the, they didn't cover the mandate that was kind of advertising for the mandate. event. Um, and as I said, the police details and those extra hours that were not mandated under the law. The, the encouraged mandate. Mm, exactly. So, but I think we came out pretty much even okay. on getting reimbursed in the total amount. And that all goes to the general fund, all those, those two reimbursement checks. Other questions? I know tomorrow is uh, the final day for people to turn, return papers, right? Yes, it is. How are we doing? We're betting about 50% right now. Oh, we're kind of way behind our normal. I That's have sent an email out to all the candidates okay. to remind them of the deadline. I'll do one more. 5 p.m. is it normally? It is 5 right? p.m. We will be open. Even so if, if you're listening at home, get your papers in. Before 5, we're there till 5. Because technically, anyone can come in and pull papers still at quarter to 5 and have 50 people outside town hall waiting to sign them and turn them in. And <laughs> that's, that's allowed. Okay. So we will be there. Yeah. Let's hope it happens tomorrow. Could be a busy day. <coughs> yes. Okay. okay, so this is just a, a highlight of what has changed in the records budget. And again, I'm only putting on the screen the items that have changed. 
So advertising, which is where all our advertising notices are carried, so it includes election notices, and that has decreased because of the one less election. Um, printing uh, various forms has gone down in my budget, mostly because we've uh, migrated to, to an electronic meeting notice. I'm not going to be printing those again in the near future. We're really utilizing an online PDF for that now, which has been very well received by um, indoor, uh, you know, uh, boards and committees, as well as those that are remote to the building. And uh, it's a, quite a convenience for people that they don't have to run down here to get their meeting notice time stamp. They send it to us electronically now. Uh, postage has gone down just strictly based on uh, various notices that are election related that we do with mailings, whether it's a confirmation to a voter registration or a deleted notice because people are registered in another community. That just goes through the normal daily mail. And uh, there is an increase for clothing allowance for the union staff. That was a contractual agreement. But all in all, the records budget, as you can see, went down by almost $900. Any questions on that? Okay. And for the elections budget, again, this, this uh, went down uh, $2,400. And uh, every line item that you can see there is a direct relationship to uh, an election cost. So uh, again, it's just regarding uh, one less election reflected in this year's budget or this coming year's budget versus this current year's budget. Anyone have any questions? Nope. Nope, okay. And that's it. We're also the information office and people come to us with a lot of inquiries and looking for help and we're there to offer it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying so late. Yes, okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Right. Serious, Michael? All right, go ahead. I just want to highlight the last slide because I know your office is the Grand Central Station in the town hall. We are. Where when somebody comes in and they're you know, misdirected or don't know where to go, they often end up at your office yeah. or on your phone line and your staff is always gracious in referring them uh, I know at times you personally walk people across the building to where they need to be so literally today I just spent an hour with someone who came in today and they were um, a little distraught um, they had five things they had to cover in town hall he wasn't quite sure where to go he was a little uh, just just under some pressures and so I literally walked him from every department to every department, and we took care of all of his needs. But it takes that kind of time, and everybody, I interfaced with the town administrator's office, with Karen Marlin, and just in, uh, uh, interfaced with the treasurer's office, and um, Kyle, Kayla, um, and the uh, assessor's office, Paula, and uh, you know, everybody was very helpful, very <coughs> patient. And I think we, you know, helped him out a lot. He was much calmer when he left. But it literally took walking him around and getting him the um, assistance that he needed and, and, and do it. And it, a lot of people don't realize that that does go on with many of the departments in the building. And the uh, people that staff the offices are so helpful to um, the customers. And uh, it's nice to see. and it's very well appreciated by them. This was one individual today, but there's many of them, as you say, Mike. So thank hey. you for that, because a lot of people do do a lot extra, and uh, it does go unnoticed, you know, and, and uh, but it's very much appreciated by that one person that is helped. He left here quite relieved, and um, uh, if it makes his day better, it makes all of our days better. Well, thank you for your work and for Janet and for Carol's work with that. Uh, I did not know the detail of that story. It was not a setup. No, uh, no, even though they did, it, did it, no. they, they did interact with my office, but I was not part of the conversation. Yeah. But, uh, this is Maggie Pelly. Yeah, yeah, and I, I want to say thank you for <coughs> in-person communications and interactions as well as via email. Your 
your it's excellent reminding us what we're supposed to be doing reminding us we need this we need that in a nice way reminding us to you know get everything organized for you so i think it's, it's great Did you do your have. conflict of interest training yet i think it's so <laughs> great to have you answer the question? i'm not saying <laughs> anything yet payment. i'll send reminders out as need be <laughs> Email is a wonderful tool yes. when it's used yes. properly. Yes. It conflicts with our time requirements right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. You're welcome. Seriously, no. Anything else? Uh, not with regard to this budget, Mr. Chairman. Okay. We're good? I believe so the next subject? Is, so I believe the town clerk will be staying for the next subject. Um, I, if the town clerk is amenable, I believe the gentleman in the back is here for a license renewal. I don't know if the board would be willing to take up the seasonal license renewals first. Um, it should be routine. Yeah. yeah, if he wants to go early, it's another fee. It's only $100. <laughs> you got to bring it to me, though. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's see. Which one do we have here? So we have two, I believe, tonight. We have Thompson and Hillview, right? We three? do. Yeah, yeah. Robert Connors. At, at three. That's all oh, Robert Connors. Flower, uh, salesman as well. I, I will note, um, in the interest of full disclosure, um, before you is the renewal of uh, the licenses at Thompson Country Club, and it includes their seasonal beer and wine or al all alcohol sales for both the clubhouse and for the starting location. I, I can't, there's a name for what that area Turnhouse. Turnhouse, okay. Um, we noted during the review of the renewal this year that we had inadvertently not been issuing a common Vixler license to uh, these locations which serve food for consumption at the clubhouse and at the turn. So that this application reflects that and the motion has been modified to approve that. But full disclosure, it was an oversight over the past few years, but they have been performing that function. I believe you have been licensed by the Board of Health for that as well. So thank you. Any Take a motion. Uh, no, sir. Okay. Uh, <coughs> First one, Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the seasonal club all alcohol license for Thompson Country Club, DBA TCC Grill, 2 Mid Iron Drive, <coughs> excuse me, to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Second. I have a motion and a second by Ms. Amina Pelly. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You know. Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the seasonal club wine and malt beverage license for Thompson Club Inc. DBA Pro Shop 2A Mid Iron Drive to expire October 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Second. A motion is second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, I move to grant a common bachelor license for Thompson Club Inc. DBA TCC Grill. Maybe an extra C in there. TCC yeah. Grill, uh, two mid iron drive to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Second. I have a second by Mr. Masseri. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, let's see. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve. I move to renew the Common Vigilant License for Golf Facilities Management, Inc., DBA Hillview Snack Bar, to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Second. Motion is second by Mrs. Minipelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to sign the ABCC 2019 Seasonal Renewal Certification. Second. I have a motion and a second. It's, it's ABCC? Yeah, this is just for the time. That's correct. We were required to report to the Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission which licenses renewed and which ones did not renew. Okay, so. So it's, a, it's a, not an issuance of a license. It's a report to the it's ABCC. It's a report. Thank you. Okay, got it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And Mr. Chairman, I move to renew the transit vendor license for the sale of flowers, Christmas trees, etc., 226 Main Street for Robert Connors, 58 Wyman Street, Woburn, to expire December 31st, 2019, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Second. A motion to second by Mr. Minupelli. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. So when can they pick up their license? Tomorrow? I believe the board will be signing them this evening, so they should be available tomorrow. Okay. Still tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this gentleman, he can come by tomorrow. Well, Thank you. Tomorrow. Thank you.
Thanks for coming in. Have a great season. Okay, we're going to go back to open meeting law. Mr. Chairman, through you, the uh, town clerk was gracious enough, gracious enough to uh, stay this evening to provide some information in response to the board's request for information regarding the, um, of, uh, the opportunity or the uh, option for remote participation of board members um, in public meetings. And there are provisions under the state law that allow um, that to occur. Uh, our recommendation, uh, based on the review to date, is the board not vote to adopt this evening. Um, only because there's still additional information that we are gathering. But we're here this evening with some high, um, I would call cursory, high level information relative to what uh, can and can't be done. And then we'll talk briefly about some of the costs that are associated with it, depending upon the will of the board. So I'll turn over to the town clerk. Barbara, thank you for the information you provided. They've been provided your report. Okay. I'm sure they've reviewed it. Yep. <coughs> All right. That, you know, the, the top page is really the summary of the key components um, for remote participation. And, this came up because I think it was Mr. O'Leary who, just, you know, brought it up yesterday or last meeting, thinking that maybe it's time to consider this. But one thing, the key thing that um, needs to be taken into account is this does not alleviate the quorum requirement for bo that boards and committees still have uh, present at the meeting room. So. Um, the, as <coughs> stated here, you know, it is permitted under the open meeting law, um, and it's under authority to the Attorney General, of course. It has oh, to be adopted by the board by majority vote. And once it's adopted, it does apply to all public bodies. Um, the select board can revoke it in the same manner as they adopt it. The fundamentals are that it needs to be considered uh, only if physical attendance would be unreasonably difficult by a member. It's not to be considered something to be used as a matter of convenience by a board or committee. Um, the select board may adopt policies and regulations that prohibit or further restrict the use of remote participation as guidelines for most boards and committees. Um, and the select board uh, would determine the amount and funding source for any costs associated with this process. Each public body needs to determine which of the acceptable methods of audible technology may be used by its members, and there's a listing in, within the law of acceptable methods. Um, the, the primary consideration is that there is that any technology that enables all parties to be clearly audible to one another are acceptable. There's no requirement for video connectivity, just audio. That is an option, uh, but again, it has to be determined that it can be um, funded if necessary and that it is clear to all parties, uh, visible to all parties present. Um, if an, uh, a body or a member who is absent requires special hearing uh, uh, capabilities through their audio connection, that has to be provided as well. Uh, the committee procedures, as outlined, are that a quorum of the public body is still required at the physical meeting room. So it doesn't alleviate that issue of if board members are away, either in meetings or on vacation, causing a lack of a quorum for a board and causing them to cancel their meeting. This does not take away that requirement for the physical um, presence of a quorum. The chairman is required at the physical meeting location, but if the chairman is the one member who's going to be absent, he would appoint someone else to chair the meeting at the physical location. Um, the names of any person or persons who are going to be participating remotely must be uh, stated and it should be in the minutes. It needs to be in the minutes. Any votes that take place when one or more members are participating remotely must be by roll call vote. And there are uh, stipulations for a remote member to still participate during an executive session if need be. Um, if technical difficulties arise with the audio communication or if video conferencing is permitted and that uh, runs into difficulties, they, they must be addressed by the chairman. 
uh, or the person chairing the meeting at that time, uh, if discussion needs to be suspended until those issues are cleared, it should be. If the issue cannot be cleared, that has to be stated in the minutes and the termination of the remote participant would be noted then as well. Uh, the remote participant would be entitled to vote, um, but again, uh, if the communication were disrupted, then that could cause a problem. So it, it is something that does exist under the open meeting law. Um, I think that it needs to be looked at cautiously uh, because boards and committees sometimes are not as well versed as this particular board on the open meeting law. They are not perhaps um, as uh, just as, as uh, aware of it as the rest of you are here. So um, I think you would want to just uh, uh, approach this cautiously, think about it. I do think it would be wise if this board were to establish any rules and procedures for all committees to follow in this fashion if you go forward with it. But that's, that's the basic uh, process for the remote participation. Are you aware of any, uh, Mr. Chairman, are you aware of any other communities that utilize it? You know, I, I believe Liz just said that she said Westford does do it. I have put out a... Andover a, does also. Pardon? Andover does also. Andover, well, I put out a blast to some of our neighboring communities, and I have not received, no, excuse me, I received one from Beverly. They do do it, but they limited it uh, to subcommittees, uh, strangely. So uh, they, it's not utilized throughout all of their boards and committees. And that's the only committee co or community I've heard back from so far. So, but Liz, as I said, has heard from Westford that they do utilize it. So I don't know to what extent. I mean, I think uh, the time has come it should be considered, certainly considered, and I, and I don't disagree that we need to implement some policies and procedures which you know, take a cautious approach and ensure that there's uh, continuity amongst boards that are going to be participating. But, you know, I think the time has come where the technology has come far enough where it can be allowed, and, uh, and it is allowed. So I think that we should uh, move ahead at some point. And again, uh, I'm not saying vote tonight to do it. But what I'm saying is I think uh, you know, reach out to Ando because I know they do it. Mm -hmm. We saw them do it uh, just last year when they were talking about the water. Uh, uh, but if they can't vote, Yes. They yeah, they can. Vote. Yeah, they, they can vote. They participate and vote. Yes. They just can't be part of a roll call. Well, they can, there has to be a, a physical be, quorum present, you know, in order to have the meeting. So that doesn't change. But if you know, if you're at the Super Bowl and want to take a little time out of your busy sure. schedule to participate and lend your expertise, we'd appreciate. I only it. have 47 days left. Yeah, so I know. <laughs> counting. No, 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 Bad but, but, no I think it's a, you know there are, there are instances where you know it's. Uh, you know, yeah. Certain members of the board have some expertise in certain areas, and I know that we have some other boards and committees and commissions that I'm liaison to where it would certainly enhance um, the meetings if someone who was away, unable to attend for, because of business reasons or other reasons, could remotely participate. They would lend a significant amount of expertise to the discussion. And uh, I think if we have the opportunity to avail ourselves of that, I think we should provide yeah, it. Yeah, no, when I saw yeah. it, just did audio, not video. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just audio, yeah. But... Uh, you know, I think we should uh, look at it sooner rather than later and um, get Do some get some feedback. Something in the budget this year. So I think an important question for us to consider is: <coughs> Would we be would, would the board find it acceptable for the participation to be by audio only, or would the board be looking for it to be by video? And uh, because the order of magnitude of the investment is a significant difference based uh, on the I information. I think audio is fine, but. That, that's one of the pieces of guidance that we sort of needed to um, to uh, address this. Um, that's simply a polycom here at the desk? Uh, yeah, and maybe an ability to get the audio from the phone into the broadcast system here. It could just be a microphone over the phone, but right. we'd have to look at that. Yeah. Um, I, I can tell you in Tingsboro where we did have this, we did that in meetings, and it did work um, uh, pretty well. Yeah, so we may have to add an extra microphone. Yeah. Uh, were there any other um, kind of guidance questions that we were looking at? Barbara, that we could use assistance for. Well, for I this. think when the board is considering it, you know, when they get into setting up some policies in place, um, 
you know, it, it just should be stressed, you know, to the committees that it cannot be used to defeat the purpose of the open meeting law, which is to provide transparency um, regarding deliberations of all of the public bodies, you know. It, again, it shouldn't be considered a convenience for people, but just because they really physically are not able to do it. I think a board and committee would need to <coughs> establish how many remote participants they would allow, uh, because even those persons need to be able to hear each other. And so whatever lines of communication are open, you want to be sure that they're clear to each other as remote participants as well as to the body in the room. And by the body in the room, it's not just the committee that's meeting, but also the audience. If there's an audience here, all of the communication has to be open to all parties. Um, the uh, chair of the committee has to be given reasonable notice if a board member wants to participate remotely so they can prepare for it and also know, in fact, that they will still have a quorum present for their meeting. Um, if you have more than one person that wants to participate remotely, it'll be keenly important for the chair to realize who will not be able to attend because can the meeting even take place if a physical quorum can't be present in the room? The answer um, to that would be no. Pardon? The answer to that would be Absolutely no. Absolutely not. So, yeah. Right, That's right. But I mean, if they don't know that till the end, then they're canceling a meeting right. on short notice. In that case, so, the be so there's people. there's things that boards and committees have to it's be aware of. Pelly. I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily in favor of it. I, I think just in the time that I've been here, there are few circumstances where, as a, just a professional courtesy, we haven't been planning meetings around people's schedules or things that have come up or planning special meetings together when we need, need to. We had a member that actually had surgery that showed up at the meeting, I think the day you, or the day after he was released. So I, I'm not necessarily in favor of it. If, if it was something, it should be such a last resort that you don't show up in person for a meeting of a public body. Uh, to me, I, I know it's allowed, I know the regulations allowed, the regulations really speak to what is permissible and isn't permissible, but I'm not necessarily in, in favor of it versus show up, show up for the meeting or you know, we, we do tend to plan around things if when we're trying to schedule. And I know other other the boards that we're committees that we're liaisons on, liaisons to try to do that too. They try to work with people's schedules. I would disagree with you, um, but I'm just presenting the process. And you know, when I went through a list of what I think should be included in, in policies. You know, it is to make sure that it's not abused or misused. Um, I do think that, you know, a limitation of the number of times it should be used by any single member should be stipulated outside of the fact that somebody might have surgery and that could, could um, make their participation um, you know, but as you say, he people, was still here. Yeah, yes. I know. And to I, our shock, right? Yeah, I, or I, not to our shock. I think yeah. that it could be stipulated. You know, you know, but limiting that so that not one particular member takes advantage of it mm -hmm. over another. Um, that what would be something that I would suggest. What about um, um, what about executive session? Not executive sessions are permitted. Oh, that, Remember, that's bad. That, well, I, no, I, okay. I, All right. I would be, I can <laughs> I, tell you, I, I think you're making a huge mistake if you guys let well, that out. That it is in the law, so I will read you that. A That's member may bad. participate remotely during an executive session, but must state at the start that no other person is present and or able to hear the discussion unless that other party's presence is acknowledged and agreed to by the members of the board in the room. So there's a provision for it. It's how comfortable any single person would feel with that. I think, um, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, you know. I, I think what we're focusing on is, is worst case scenarios, and we're, we're talking about first of all volunteers uh, of our community who are willing to participate and put themselves out and sacrifice their time and offer their expertise. Secondly, you know, if we're talking about committees, which uh, committees and commissions which come under our purview, you know, these are the people that we're appointing to these boards, committees, and commissions. And uh, um, I can't think it's been a long time since I've had any regret in relation to who we've appointed to 
uh, some boards, committees, and commissions. You know, everybody's a, a high integrity and uh, uh, good devoted public servants, and I'm not the least bit concerned about, and, and, and again, it can't be, there aren't abuses in relation to it, because if there's not a quorum present, it can't take place. Uh, so, and again, it, if there's a, uh, an individual who, you know, is unable to attend uh, for reasons other than, you know, physical or some business commitments um, over long periods of time, then it's incumbent upon us as the appointing authorities to decide if that individual is worthy to continue to serve on the board, committee, or commission. So, you know, there's checks and balances in place. Uh, the technology is available. Um, these people are volunteers. And... Um, as I stated before, a lot of these people have uh, significant uh, long-time experiences with the boards, committees, and commissions that they serve on. They lend some expertise. And uh, a lot of the boards, committees, and commissions also have specific uh, public hearing dates, which are holding up developers, individuals, and uh, because of the inability for them to telecommunicate, uh, again, not a quorum, telecommunicate, they're not going to be able to lend there their opinion or uh, their expertise. And I, I just think it, uh, uh, the law is in place to allow it to happen uh, for a good reason. And I think you know, it, it doesn't do anything in relation to a, a quorum requirement. So I really think we should uh, take a good, strong look at it. And again, I'm not going to call into question people's integrity on a wish women a maybe and who might abuse it later on down the road. You know, that would be for the appointing authorities to deal with at that particular point in time. Yes, I, I'm not uncomfortable about the situation at all, except for executive session. I, I just. But that could I, be one of the stipulations yeah. that well, the board makes to. I see, and I feel bad because I, I again, I should, probably wasn't going to abstain from the discussion or the vote because, you know, if the, you know, this is a tough one. I think the future board should discuss this, not me. I apologize, but. Uh, I know I have a responsibility, yeah. but... I'm bringing this forward only because it was brought up at the last I'm meeting. I'm just giving you my opinion. I think you go a dangerous road by and letting executive that... session discussion happen when somebody's not in the room. Uh, I think they can participate in open session, no problem, because everyone's hearing it. But you don't know who's in the room. You don't know where they are. You don't know where the information is being heard. You know, I'm sorry. It just There's no way to control that. And maybe that's the military side of me. You know, it's the way I grew up, the industry I was in. Well, it's, I, I think that it, it's a, a good point to bring out, you know, because I don't think uh, I would necessarily look at it as somebody ab abusing it intentionally, but it's the misuse of it unintentionally um, that can easily happen. And if the board is going to go forward with it, you're all liaisons to these boards and committees, and you could stipulate that you're going to require them to report to you, those committees that, for which you are liaison to, every time that they use it, just to kind of keep a handle on it and see how, it, how it's monitored. I think it's important for the chairman of every committee to acknowledge receipt of the guidelines, you know, on an annual basis perhaps, and be responsible to distribute it to all of their members. These people are all volunteers and they give us their time, but that's where I say they're not so in tune to the open meeting law. When you talk about people, um, if they don't have a quorum, they're not going to meet. I can't tell you how many times these smaller boards and committees call our office and tell us, well, we're not going to have a quorum at this meeting, but we still want to hold a workshop. It's not allowed, but they, they see a difference between, well, we just want to throw some ideas around and, and we won't vote. But it's still a meeting. It's a deliberation of the public body. But that, that so doesn't change from you know, the, the current practices that are in place now as opposed to the practices that would be I'm in the future. I'm just saying, but is so it right? Uh, it's you know, not and, right. And, 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 and I'm, glad I'm glad I'm hearing the tenant change a little bit in relation to, you know, worrying about, you know, the integrity of the people that we're, we're talking about. Where it has nothing future. to do with integrity. So Absolutely just, uh, nothing. And again, you know, as liaison, no, I've no heard over the years. No, 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 Over the years, I've heard from, you know, chairs, you know, as we're talking about people reappointing, and every member here has the same thing. You know, we have discussions with the chairs of the various committees as to the participation level of other members who are up for reappointment. And that's weighed, engaged, and I think that will continue to be the practice. So, you know, I just think, you know, the technology is there, the laws are in place. Um, you know, we can put some uh, safeguards on, which, you know, instead of being broad, can be narrowed. But I think we should uh, provide an opportunity for all of our 
uh, volunteer appointees to participate if they're able. That's all. So what's the plan? Do uh, bring this back up, Mike, at a future meeting? That's probably the best. Yeah. Okay. All right. If you can get some of the cost data for that meeting, that would be great. Steve, uh, I think I left my agenda. When, when do we think we're going to, uh, we'll be prepared to talk about it again? I think it's a combination of really the availability on the board meeting schedules that are coming up because they're, they're all pretty, pretty busy. Um, we only have three meetings left, right, for the, to we approve the budget? Correct. I mean, I, I think based on the feedback here, the investment is probably not likely to be very significant given yeah. the, we're not pursuing the audio, the, the video, excuse me, just, just, just the pursuit of the audio. Um, I, I'd want to talk further with the clerk and with the IT director and yourself, Mr. Chair. Well, and we need Norcam, I believe, to be part of the discussion because yes. they would have to ensure that the folks at home are hearing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we certainly can try for either April 1st or April 22nd, um, if that's the intention. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. In the meantime, my suggestion is just to think of, you know, the policies and procedures you want to have in place. I have, a, you know, some that I have thought of, well, I but I, the, I yeah. you know, think that each board member might think of something that, you know. Yeah, if other communities have it already in place, and we've seen it in practice, uh, I mean, we may not have to reinvent the wheel, you know, or we may want to tweak it. Yeah. Well, I'll certainly get in touch with the Andover clerk and find out what they have in place, since you know yeah. for sure that they do yeah, it. Like a start it's, on TV. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mr. Masseri? My feeling about it is positive. We have the technology today that we didn't have yesterday, and I think you've done an excellent job of trying to schedule meetings around people's availability. But there will be an occasion when someone might have yeah. be sick, you know, in shot notice, or... Or in recovery, yeah. In recovery, yeah. or you weren't able to find a date that everyone could attend. I think when you reach that level, then you permit it. Right. And I think you can put a policy together associated with dealing with that. Yep. It's just another opportunity to keep things going. And, but I think there are things you try before you get to that point. That's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. I mean, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. Matt, thank all you. right. On to the, approve the FY 2020 employee health insurance. Mr. Gilbert. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I'll be brief just because I know the hour is late, but the, 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 the uh, short explanation is that the news is very favorable for the renewal of our active employee health insurance um, plans for fiscal year 2020, uh, which begins on July 1st, 2019 and runs through June 30th, 2020. This will be the third year of our using the uh, PFA uh, or uh, participating funding arrangement. Um, where we basically self-insure a uh, portion of the deductible and um, buy and purchase a higher deductible plan from Blue Cross Blue Shield, who is our health insurance carrier. Um, we received a very, very favorable renewal at 2.6% um, uh, at a 2.6% increase when compared to this current fiscal year's um, plan, um, which is uh, fantastic given that more recently we've seen the range between five, seven, ten, or more percent as the options that are available to us. And really the reason that we've seen the success is um, uh, certainly a little bit of luck, um, but the actions of our employees taking advantage of the many tools that have come along with the PFA, including a uh, uh, available uh, on-call um, medical assistance through an 800 number, um, using um, uh, technology that, that's available for that today, um, using other options for purchasing testing or other types of screening that are available through the PFA. But probably most significantly, the PFA itself um, is a place for us to absorb any potential um, increase in claims uh, without that resulting in an immediate impact on Blue Cross Blue Shield and therefore an increase in our rate. So uh, things have been ver looking very good with regard to health insurance. Um, the recommendation is that the board vote to approve a 
the plan design, which calls for an increase in the active employee plans um, per, uh, premiums by 2.6 percent. That includes an increase in the accrual of funding for the PFA of 2.6 percent as well. Um, we are on track to have a surplus at the end of this fiscal year. Um, that's important. Um, it, surplus, uh, while it may not be as significant as we uh, were forecasting in at the end of fiscal year 2018, uh, nonetheless, uh, it is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that is a great position for the town to be in, not only for our employees, but for the taxpayer that funds 70 percent of the premium. Um, this is separate and distinct from the 50-50 share that we have with our retirees. Um, their plan year runs from January 1st to June to December 31st, and we generally look at that review, that renewal in October and November. Uh, but uh, overall, uh, with regard to the health insurance plan, you know, almost two years under our belt and going into our third year, the PFA has performed very well, and I, I wish to recognize the leadership of the board um, to take on this uh, new uh, structure, one that's very unique uh, to North Reading when compared to other cities and towns but also to our employees and the Insurance Advisory Committee, which represents all of our uh, employee units uh, who have been very supportive and uh, very much bought into the program since day one. Uh, we've prepared a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the attached fiscal year 2020 employee health insurance plan entitled Renewal Plan Year July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020 as proposed by Reimbursement Specialists, Inc. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Mr. O'Leary. Uh, again, I just think it's important that, um, for, first of all, this is fantastic news, you know, and again, but uh, that being said, next year it can be a flip side, something totally different. So I think it's important that any realized savings that we have here, that we uh, be very cautious in relation to what we do and how we um, put it into the operating budget. You know, this could be a, uh, again, a one-time windfall. I don't want to see it necessarily uh, being just incorporated into uh, general operating expenses, whereby we're increasing our operating expenses and not be able to sustain it going forward. Uh, we're still in our infancy stages here. We're, we have two years of a track record, which has been very favorable. Uh, but I think we need to move cautiously and conservatively in relation to any savings at this particular point in time. Build up our reserves, which is being a appears to be getting healthier, which is terrific. Uh, but again, I think we need to uh, ensure that we're not just going to uh, put the, the savings into the operating budget and then not be able to sustain the level of services we currently enjoy. So uh, I would just uh, ask that the administration, the finance planning team, you know, take that into consideration as we're finalizing our budget numbers here and uh, mm -hmm. see what we can do to uh, again, continue to build our reserves for that time when it will come. Uh, we were looking at double-digit, sure. you know, increases in our in our insurance costs. Thank you. I will say though, the PFA is working. There is a a very nice cushion number in that fund right now, um, and I don't disagree with your philosophy on it. Not so sure what that exact number is, but we will certainly bring it up at the fin next financial plan team meeting and discuss it. Um, it's definitely worthy of that, and we'll bring it back to the board. I will also want to say that you know, we got to give the employees some credit here as well. You know, this new plan moving over to Tony's name of the company again. I, uh, I integrated benefits group. That's it. You know, they've provided a lot of support to the staff, but also bringing in this 1-800-MD, it's a free consultation. I mean, they get a lot of <coughs> service over the phone where they don't have to necessarily go into the uh, a hospital or see a doctor where it causes a, uh, a claim. And it's all about claims data, and I think them taking advantage of it, and I hope more of them take advantage of that 1-800-MD because this is the result of it. If we can continue to work on reducing claim data and continue to keep giving them good care, really good care, it's a win-win. So I want to thank them because a lot of them have, based on the feedback we got from IDG, that uh, IBG, that the, the employees are using it. Not all of them, but a good chunk of them are, and I hope as we go forward they continue to take advantage of it. So if there's nothing else to be said, we'll take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed?
unanimous. Okay. Appointments. We have one for Board of Registers and the Facility Master Plan Committee. Mr. Chairman, I move to appoint uh, Kylie Gamlin to the Board of Registrars for a term to run April 1st, 2019 through April 1st, 2022. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, this is, is that a roll a, call? This is basically a reappointment. Uh, uh, she's also uh, been recommended by the uh, Democratic Town Committee. There are recommendations by both Republican and Democratic Town Committees to the Board of Registrars. Uh, so one Democrat, one Republican. Uh, and uh, also recommended by the town clerk uh, for reappointment. We don't roll call this one, do we? Uh, it's only one, one spot, one, yeah. one appointment. So doesn't require it. Doesn't Thank require. You. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Mr. Chairman, through you, the next motion we've left blank the designation of a board member on behalf of the select board. I don't know if the board wishes to select a member to participate on the committee now or at some point in the future, but uh, the rest of the membership, uh, it would appear, has been uh, identified by the committees that would, we've asked to be represented. I thank them for their effort to identify somebody. Bob, I mean, sorry, Steve, Andy, or Kate, I think it obviously should be one of you. Um, sure, put my name on it. Steve, you're, you're, you're good with that, right? Kate, you good with that? I got a feeling I, I won't have much competition here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with that. You're good? Okay. <laughs> Mr. Masseri, you're good with Mr. Schultz sitting on the master plan committee? Say no. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the... Uh, Remaining board members to step up. Oh, yeah. He's stepping up. He's stepping up. Yes. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move to appoint the following individuals to the facilities master plan committee for terms to expire June 30th, 2020. Andrew Schultz, Select Board. William Bellavance, Community Planning Commission. Julie Spur Knight, Department of Public Works. Mark Hall, Historic District Commission. Donald Kelleher, Capital Improvement Planning Committee. Albie Herbert, Albie Herbert, Finance Committee. And Diana Bootwell, School Committee. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Minutes. <laughs> January 28th, 2019. Let's see what we got here. <coughs> okay. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the January 28th, 2019 regular session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I will no. be. I was not present, so I will uh, abstain. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And one what abstention. February 25th, 2019, regular. The chairman. I move to approve the February 25th regular session minutes as written. Second. second. We got a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz. Any discussion? Not Once again, heard. I oh, was sorry. not present, so I will be abstaining. None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And one abstention. Executive session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the February 25th executive session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz. Any discussion? Again, I was not present, so I will be abstaining. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? One abstention. March 2nd, 2019, budget meeting. I'm not sure. I just have a question as to... Well, I don't know if it was Mr. Walpin who was in the other. I think it was uh, uh, he was here. Alan Walpin. Yeah. No. Uh, Alan. No. Oh, you know what? He was passing papers, and then he that's, disappeared. That's not Alan Walpin. Yeah. That's uh, no, that's Richard Walner. You're thinking. Yeah, Rich Walner yeah. instead of Mr. Wal it's, it's Mr. Walner that was here at the wall panel. Which meeting? Huh? I don't think, did Mr. Walpin move out of town? 
March 2nd, 2019 budget meeting. It says it's Saturday, wasn't it? Abby Hobart, Daniel Palmer, and Alan Walpin were in the audience. Yep. Uh, I don't think it was the well, it wasn't Mr. No, Walpin. I don't think so. Well, I know Richard was here yeah, for it, it, at least a little bit. Yeah, I don't Mr. think he was Walpin. here for the whole thing. Yeah, I think he was oh, he gathering here. signatures oh, okay. and then he left. Yeah. 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 So I don't oh, you're correct. What? Should we read Richard Johnson? Richard Johnson? I believe so, yes. Okay, so we'll make that pen and ink change. As Mark. So, so this, this should be Richard Johnson? Right. Yes. Mr. Johnson, right. So I'm just going to make the note on this here, and it can just, we'll approve them as amended. Okay. <laughs> Wait a minute. Did we already approve this contract? <laughs> so, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the March 2nd, <clears throat> 2019 regular session minutes as amended. Motion is second. Any more discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? M Mr. Chairman, through you, for the record, I did take those minutes. It was not Ms. Brooks. <laughs> we know. That's, you know, we, unfortunately, we Mike, had we known that about a half hour ago, <laughs> we probably wouldn't approve the contract. So I we'll apologize just to Ms. Brooks, <laughs> to the board, and to Mr. Johnson. <laughs> um, apology accepted. March 4th, 2019, regular session. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the March 4th, regular, 4th, 2019, regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Aye. Executive session. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the March 4th, 2019, executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion is second. Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Legal bills, January. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve legal bills for January 2019 in the amount of $10,964.79 as follows. Copelman and Page, PC, General, $4,808.79. Copelman and Page, PC, Labor, $6,156. Thompson West Publishing, $744 for a total of $11,708.79. Second. A motion and a second. Any more discussion? Any discussion? None heard. All those in favor, aye. aye. Opposed? Unanimous. June Town Meeting, Warren Articles. Mr. Chairman, through you. On page um, 126 of the packet. Thank you. Um, I'll just note the things that have been added, the things that are not on there, and the things that may still be um, out there. So we've added the appropriation of funding for the permitting software, which we discussed at the last meeting. We've added the funding of town building repairs. That's normally an October town meeting warrant. This is done with the intention of trying to avoid the need for any appropriation of funding at the October town meeting. We are looking to try to consolidate the financial articles to the extent possible to the June town meeting, and thus this article, which would ordinarily have been in October, will be in, uh, is being proposed for June. We talked about the Special Education Reserve Fund. That's on there as well. We've talked about the plastic bag uh, ban, the so-called plastic bag ban, uh, which uh, we are also are working on. And then we do have a street acceptance that's come forward from the Planning Commission for a Little Meadow Way that will be ready. A um, couple things that are not on the list that I'll just note for the board and uh, leave to their discretion. Uh, we do not have an article on there for special legal counsel. Um, if we wish to put one on there as a placeholder as a just in case, we certainly could do that. Um, I'll leave that to the board to decide. Um, Swan Pond Road, um, there was some discussion about that. Um, that, that discussion seems to have um, quieted down. I'm not aware that we've received all of the required sign-offs with regard to the project, so I don't know that much more has happened since October town meeting, and at this point there is no article on there for that project. Okay. Um, the, uh, there, we, there has been some discussion relative to whether or not we would look for an additional health insurance stabilization fund. Um, that's something the finance director and I are looking at and may come back to the select board with a recommendation on. Um, and we've also had some informal conversation about um, the need to um, develop, uh, to seek funding for identifying a potential strategy relative to compensation in general um, for town employees. 
um, in the in light of the changing market and the recent adjustments to the minimum wage, um, something that we're talking about, not necessarily looking to propose an article, but I just felt it important to make the board aware that that's something that we have had some discussion on. It may not be for now, maybe for a future point in time. And I believe that's all of the articles. Just in relation to the Swan Pond Road, I, I wouldn't necessarily abandon it yet. I think we need to check back with uh, Mrs. Cravata. And I think there was just one property owner up there that was holding out. It was either one or two. It was, it was just one property owner that was holding out, uh, and holding up the possibility of that uh, project moving forward or even being considered to move forward. Uh, you know, I, I think if we reach out, mm -hmm. at least have a space holder for it, and uh, someone could reach out to uh, Mrs. Cravada to find out what the status of things are. If the community up there is looking to abandon the effort, let us know. You know, if they want to continue to do it and get a hold of that uh, one particular party, get them to sign off, that would certainly facilitate things. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, anything else? We're good on that? Okay. Town Administrator Report. So a few things to note. As of March 13th, the DPW has responded to snow and ice events on 34 occasions. We've expended $316,213, which is $141,213 above the $175,000 appropriation. The amount does not include open purchase orders. As I've mentioned before, we do budget a carryover of snow and ice expenses in the amount of $300,000, and we are approximately $141,000 into that carryover. I attached information that was provided to me by the town manager in Reading regarding the speed limit on Haverhill Street. Reading has approved a uniform speed limit of 35 miles per hour on the entire length of Haverhill Street from the North Reading Town Line to Route 129. Director of Public Works informs me that JRM is willing to extend its trash and recycling collection contract with the town another two years through fiscal year 2020 and 2021 at the existing annual rate. The rate can be reduced by $25,000 if the town were to agree to move to a five-day collection schedule. We received another informal quote that was significantly higher through the discussion process, and at this time it's our intention to continue at the current rate with no change to the collection schedule based on this proposal. That will also avoid a need based on our projections at this point in time for any further adjustment to the trash fee, which we had um, stated last year was uh, a potential to need to be further adjusted. So we're hopeful we can avoid that or continue to avoid that. Okay. That's good news. I uh, attached news. Okay. Yeah, it sure is, yes. I, I attached a copy of uh, the amendment to the license agreement between the town and Group 1 Entertainment, um, as was uh, approved by the Hillview Commission. The amendment relieves the licensee of the requirement to operate the, rest in the restaurant and allows the town to permit the golf course manager to seasonally serve alcohol from the clubhouse. We're told that Group 1 intends to operate the former Tees Tavern as a function space and the building may remain um, signed as such through December. The town will continue to receive 3% of the gross <coughs> revenue from Group 1's use of the facility. Um, one thing I'll just note with regard to that is there was some discussion at the last meeting about, sorry, two meetings ago, uh, about the uh, so-called um, extension of the agreement. The current agreement provides for an option for extension at the discretion of the operator, the licensee, um, but also provides provisions for termination with nine months notice for both the operator uh, and by the, uh, for the town of North Reading as well. And that concludes my comments. Okay. Mr. O'Leary? All set. Thank Mr. You. Seary? I'm all set. Mr. Schultz? Just a brief comment. I want to um, give my thanks to Mel Webster, whose last day on the school committee was tonight. Mel's uh, just bought a new house out of town, so he resigned his seat. He's no longer going to be a resident. And Mel served on the school committee for 15 years, and I don't know how many meetings, subcommittee meetings, explanations he made to people on Facebook. I mean, he has done it all as far as the schools are concerned, and we're a better town for his service. And uh, we thank him and wish him and Kathleen the best as they move on to their new home. And I just hope people get their papers in tomorrow, and I hope we have a really good election coming up. So looking forward to that. And that's all I have. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. I got a motion to adjourn. Second by Mrs. Minipelli. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.